Section 24 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Introduction. The advice given by Demosthenes in the Third Philippic, spoken before the middle of 341 BC, was in the main followed. He himself was sent almost immediately to Byzantium, where he renewed the alliance between that city and Athens, and at the same time entered into relations with Abdos and the Thracian princes. Rhodes and probably Chios and Kos were also conciliated, and an embassy was sent to the king of Persia to ask for aid against Philip. The king appears to have sent assistance to Diopithes, and it is also stated, not on the best authority, that he sent large sums of money to Demosthenes and Hyperides. Demosthenes further succeeded in conjunction with Callias of Chalcis in organizing a league against Philip, which included Corinth, Megara, Corsera, and the Arcananians, and which at least supplied a considerable number of men and some funds. The cities of Euboea, most of which had been in the hands of Philip's party, were also formed in, into a confederacy, in alliance with Athens, under the leadership of Chalcis. Philistides was expelled from Araeus about July 341, by the allied forces under Sisyphon. Later in the summer, Phocion drove Claytarchus from Eritrea. On the motion of Aristonicus, the Athenians voted Demosthenes a golden crown, which was conferred on him in the theatre at the Great Dionysia, in March 340. The arrest of Anaxenus of Aureus and his condemnation as a spy acting in Philip's interest must have occurred about the same time. Not long afterwards, Demosthenes succeeded in carrying out a complete reorganization of the triarchic system by which he made the burden of the expense very strictly according to property, and secured a regular and efficient supply of ships, money, and men. In the meantime, in 341 or 340, the island of Peperethus was attacked by Philip's ships in revenge for the seizure of the Macedonian garrison in Halonasus by the Peperethians, and the Athenian admirals were ordered to retaliate. Philip himself had been pursuing this course in Thrace, and on the rejection of his request to Byzantium for an alliance he laid siege, late in 340, to Perinthus, which lay on his way to Byzantium, sending part of his forces through the Chersonese. Aided by Byzantine and Persian soldiers, Perinthus held out, till at last Philip took most of his forces and besieged Byzantium itself. He had shortly before this sent to Athens an express declaration of war, and received a similar declaration from her, the formal excuse for which was found in the recent seizure by his ships of some Athenian merchant vessels. But with help from Athens, Chios, Rhodes, and Kos, the Byzantines maintained their defense. Philip's position became serious, but he managed by a ruse to get his ships away into the open sea, and even to do some damage to the Athenian settlers in the Chersonese. In the winter he withdrew from Byzantium, and in 339 made an incursion into Scythia, but, returning through the country of the Triboli, he sustained some loss, and was severely wounded. Later in the year a new sacred war which had arisen gave him a convenient opportunity for the invasion of Greece. At the meeting of the Amphictyonic Council in the autumn of 340, Lyskines was one of the representatives of Athens. The Athenians had recently offended Thebes by regilding and dedicating in the restored temple at Delphi fifty shields, with an inscription stating that they were spoil taken from the Medes and the Thebans when they fought against the Hellenes, probably at Plataea in 479. The Locrians of Pamphysa intended, according to Aeschines' account, to propose that the council should fine Athens fifty talents. Aeschines rose to state the case for Athens, but a delegate from Pamphysa forbade all mention of the Athenians, and demanded their exclusion from the temple, on the ground of their alliance with the accursed Phocians. Aeschines retorted by charging the Amphysians with cultivating and building upon the sacred plain of Syra, acts forbidden for all time in 586 BC, and roused the council to such indignation that they gathered a body of men and destroyed the harbor and the unlawful buildings of Syra, but they were severely handled by the Amphysians and the council now voted that the Amphictyonic state should send representatives to discuss the question of war against Amphisa, to a meeting to be held at Thermopylae before the spring meeting of the council. To this preliminary meeting, the Athenians, though inclined to view Aeschines' performance with favor, on the advice of Demosthenes, sent no representative, nor did the Thebans, the allies of Amphisa. War was declared by the Amphictyons against Amphisa, but Catythus, the Thessalian, who had been appointed general, made little headway, and, at the spring or autumn meeting of the council, declared that the Amphictyonic states must either send men and money, or else make Philip their general. Philip was, of course, at once appointed, but instead of proceeding against Amphisa, marched to Alatria and fortified it. This caused the greatest alarm at Athens. 
Demosthenes was immediately dispatched to Thebes, where he succeeded by what appear to have been liberal and judicious proposals in making an alliance between Thebes and Athens, in spite of the attempts of Philip's envoys to counteract his influence. Euboa, Megara, Corinth, and other members of the League also sent help. Philip himself called upon his own friends in the Peloponnese for aid, and at last moved towards Amphisa. Demosthenes seems now to have succeeded in applying the festival money to purposes of war, and with the aid of Lycurgus, who became controller of the festival fund, to have amassed a large sum for the use of the state. At the Dionysia of 338 he was again crowned, on the proposal of Demomeles and Hyperides. The allies at first won some successes and refortified some of the Phocian towns, but afterwards unfortunately divided their forces, and so enabled Philip to defeat the two divisions separately, and to destroy Amphisa. Philip's proposals of peace found supporters both in Thebes and in Athens, but were counteracted by Demosthenes. Late in the summer of 338, the decisive battle was fought at Chaeronea, and resulted in a total rout of the allies. Demosthenes himself was one of the fugitives. Philip placed a Macedonian garrison in Thebes, restored his exiled friends to power there, established a council of 300, and, through them, put to death or banished his enemies. He also gave Orchomenus, Thespiae, and Platiae their independence. After a moment of panic, the Athenians, led by Demosthenes, Lycurgus, and Hyperides, proceeded to take all possible measures for the defense of the city, while private munificence supplied the treasury. Demosthenes himself superintended the repair of the fortifications, and went on a mission to secure a supply of corn. But Philip, instead of marching upon Athens, sent a message by Demades, whom he had taken prisoner at Chaeronea, and the assembly, in reply, instructed Demades, Aeschines, and Phocion to ask Philip to release his Athenian prisoners. Philip released them without ransom, and sent Antipater and Alexander, with the ashes of the Athenian dead, to offer terms of peace. By the peace of Demades, concluded while Demosthenes was still absent, the alliance between Athens and Philip was renewed. The independence of Athens was guaranteed. Oropus was taken from Thebes and restored to Athens, and she was permitted to retain Salamis, Samos, Delos, and probably Lemnos and Imbros. On the other hand, she lost all her possessions on the Hellespont and in the Chersonese and promised to join the league which Philip intended to form for the invasion of Persia. Demosthenes was selected by the assembly to deliver the funeral oration upon those who fell at Chaeronea, and although the Macedonian party attacked him repeatedly in the law courts, he was always acquitted. Philip paid a long visit to the Peloponnese, in the course of which he placed a Macedonian garrison in Corinth, ravaged Laconia, giving parts of it to his allies, the Argives and the Arcadians, and announced his plans for the invasion of Persia at the head of the Greeks. He then returned to Macedonia. In 337, Demosthenes was again commissioner of fortifications, as well as controller of the festival fund, the most important office in the state. He not only performed his work most efficiently, but gave considerable sums for public purposes out of his private fortune. And early in 336, Tessifin proposed, and the council resolved, that he should once more be crowned at the Dionysia. But before the proposal could be brought to the assembly, Aeschines indicted Tessifin for its alleged illegality. The trial did not take place until late in the summer of 330. We do not know the reason for so long a delay, but probably the events of the intervening time were such as to render the state of public feeling unfavorable to Aeschines. In 336, Philip was assassinated and was succeeded by Alexander. In 335, Alexander destroyed Thebes, which had revolted, and sold its inhabitants into slavery. He also demanded from Athens the surrender of Demosthenes and other anti-Macedonian politicians and generals, but was persuaded to be content with the banishment of Charidamus and Epiphaltus, and the promise of the prosecution of Demosthenes for using subsidies from Persia to help Thebes, the prosecution which was allowed to drop. From 334 onwards, Alexander was pursuing his conquests in the east, and we know practically nothing of the history of Athens until the trial of Tessaphon came on in 330. Aeschines alleged against Tessaphon, one, that it was illegal to propose to crown anyone who had not passed his examination before the board of auditors at the end of his term of office, and that Demosthenes, who had been the commissioner of fortifications and controller of the festival fund, was still in this position. 2. That it was illegal to proclaim the grant of a crown at the Dionysia, except in the case of crowns conferred by foreign states. And 3. That it was illegal to insert untrue statements into the public records, and that the language in which Tessaphon's decree described the political career of Demosthenes was untrue. On the first point, Aeschines was almost certainly right. Demosthenes' defense is sophistical, and all that could really be said was that the rule had often been broken before. On the second point, certainty is impossible. The most probable view, though it also has its difficulties, is that there were two inconsistent laws, and that one of them permitted the proclamation in the theater, if expressly voted by the people, 
but the alleged illegality had certainly been often committed. The third point, which raised the question of the value to Athens of Demosthenes's whole political life, was that upon which the case really turned, and it is to this that Demosthenes devotes the greater part of his speech, breaking up his reply into convenient stages by discussions of a far less happy description of the other counts of the indictment, and of the character and career of Aeschines. As in the speech on the embassy, certain facts are misrepresented, and there are passages which are in bad taste, but Demosthenes proves beyond doubt his unswerving loyalty to the high ideal of policy which he had formed for his country, and it is with good reason that parts of the speech have always been felt to reach a height of eloquence which has never been surpassed. The jury acquitted Tessaphon, and Aeschines, failing to obtain a fifth part of the votes, and thus incurring a heavy fine in the loss of some rights of the rights of a citizen, left Athens and lived most of the remainder of his life at Rhodes. The following is an analysis of the speech in outline. Section 1. Introduction. Section 2. Defense against charges irrelevant to the indictment, including parts as follows. Part 1. Introduction. Part 2. Postponement of reply to charges against his private life. Part 3. Reply to charges against his public life, with subsections as follows. Part 3a. Criticism of Aeschines' Method of Attack Part 3b Reply in Reference to the Peace of Philocrates Section 3 Defense Against the Indictment Itself Including Parts as Follows Part 1 Introduction Part 2 Deference of His Policy B.C. 346-340 to Part 3 The Alleged Illegality of Crowning Him Before He Had Passed His Audit Part 4 The Alleged Illegality of the Proclamation in the Theater Part 5. Conclusion, including criticism of Aeschines' method of attack. Section 4. Aeschines' life and character, including parts as follows. Part 1. Introduction. Part 2. Parentage and early life of Aeschines. Part 3. Aeschines' connection with Antiphon, Pythus, Anaxenus, and others. Part 4. Aeschines' part in stirring up the war against Amphisa in 339. Section 5. Demosthenes' own policy in 339 and 338, including parts as follows. Part 1. Narrative and defense of the alliance with Thebes. Part 2. Why did not Aeschines protest at the time? Part 3. Defense of his policy as true to the spirit of Athenian history. Part 4. Narrative and defense continue. Part 5. Further criticism of Aeschines' method of attack. Section 6. Replies to various arguments of Aeschines, including parts as follows. Part 1. Aeschines' comparison of the inquiry to the examination of a balance sheet. Part 2. A proper inquiry would show that Demosthenes had increased the resources of Athens. Part 3. To reply to the charge of saddling Athens with an undue share of the expense of the war. Part 4. Reply to the charge of responsibility for the defeat of Chaeronea. Part 5. Vindication of his policy after the Battle of Chaeronea. Part 6. Reply to Aeschines' remarks about the harm done to Athens by Demosthenes' bad fortune, with subsections as follows. Part 6a. General remarks. Part 6b. The fortune of Demosthenes. Part 6c. The fortune of Aeschines. Part 6d. Comparison of the two. Part 6e. Demosthenes' use of his fortune for purposes of public and private munificence. Part 6f. Demosthenes not responsible for the misfortunes of Athens. Part 7. Reply to Aeschines' warning against Demosthenes' cleverness, with subsections as follows. Part 7a. Comparison of the use made of their talents by the two orators. Part 7b. The choice of Demosthenes, not Aeschines, to deliver the funeral oration. Part 8. Aeschines' feelings about the defeat of Chaeronea, Part 9, the part played by traitors in recent history. Section 7, Epilogue, including parts as follows. Part 1, Demosthenes' incorruptibility. Part 2, Demosthenes' measures for the protection of Athens. Part 3, comparison of the services of the two orators to Athens. Part 4, reply to the comparison of Demosthenes with the men of old by a final comparison of the two orators. Part 5. Peroration. End of section 24. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 25 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown, Part 1. I pray first, men of Athens, to every god and goddess, that the good will which I ever feel towards the city and towards all of you may in equal measure be vouchsafed to me by you at this present trial, and secondly, a prayer which especially touches yourselves, your consciences, and your reputation, the gods may put it into your minds not to take counsel of my adversary in regard to the spirit in which you ought to hear me, for that would surely be a cruel thing, but of the laws and of your oath, wherein besides all the precepts of justice, this also is written that you shall listen to both sides with a like mind, and this means not only that you should have formed no prejudice and should accord equal good will to each, but also that you should give leave to every man who pleads before you to adopt that order and make that defense upon which he has resolved and fixed his choice. I am in many respects at a disadvantage in the present controversy as compared with Aeschines, and particularly men of Athens, in two points of importance. The first is that I am not contending for the same stake as he, it is not the same thing for me to lose your goodwill now, as it is for him to fail to win his case. Since for me, but I would say nothing unpleasant at the opening of my address, I say only that Aeschines can well afford to risk this attack upon me. The second disadvantage lies in the natural and universal tendency of mankind to hear invective and denunciation with pleasure, and to be offended with those who praise themselves. And of the two courses in question, that which contributes to men's pleasure has been given to Aeschines, and that which annoys everyone, I may say, is left for me. If, to avoid giving such annoyance, I say nothing of all that I myself have done, it will be thought that I am unable to clear myself of the charges against me, or to show the grounds upon which I claim to deserve the distinction. If, on the other hand, I proceed to speak of my past acts and my political life, I shall often be compelled to speak of myself. I will endeavor, then, to do this as modestly as possible and for all that the necessities of the case compel me to say, the blame must in fairness be borne by the prosecutor, who initiated a trial of such a kind as this. I think, men of Athens, that you would all admit that this present trial equally concerns myself and Tessaphon, and demands no less earnest attention from me than from him, for while it is a painful and a grievous thing for a man to be robbed of anything, particularly if it is at the hands of an enemy that this befalls him, it is especially so when he is robbed of your good will and kindness, just in proportion as to win these is the greatest possible gain. And because such is the issue at stake in the present trial, I request and entreat you all alike to give me, while I make my defense upon the charges that have been brought against me, a fair hearing, as you are commanded to do by the laws, those laws to which their original maker, your well-wisher and the people's friend, Solon, thought fit to give the sanction not of enactment only, but also of an oath on the part of those who act as judges not because he distrusted you, so at least it seems to me, but because he saw that a defendant could not escape from the imputations and the slanders which fall with special force from the prosecutor, because he is the first to speak, unless each of you who sit in judgment, keeping his conscience pure in the sight of God, will receive the pleadings of the later speaker with the same favor, and will thus, because his attention has been given equally and impartially to both sides, form his decision upon the case in its entirety. And now, when I am about, as it seems, to render an account of my whole private life and public career, I would once more invoke the aid of the gods. And in the presence of all of you, I pray, first, that the good will which I ever feel towards the city and towards all of you may in equal measure be vouchsafed to me by you at this trial. And secondly, that whatsoever the judgment upon this present suit will conduce to your public reputation and the purity of each man's conscience, that judgment they may put into all your minds to give. Now, if Aeschines had confined his charges to the subject of the indictment, I, too, in making my defense, would have dealt at once with the actual resolution of the council. But since he has devoted no less a portion of his speech to the relation of other matters, and for the most part has spoken against me falsely, I think it is necessary, and at the same time just, that I should deal briefly, men of Athens, with these, in order that none of you may be led by irrelevant arguments to listen less favorably to my pleas in answer to the indictment itself. As for his slanderous vituperation of my private life, mark how straightforward and just how is the reply that I make. If you know me as the man that he charged me with being, for my life has been spent nowhere but in your own midst, do not even suffer me to speak. No, not that my whole public career has been one of transcendent merit, but rise and condemn me without delay. But if, in your judgment and belief, I am a better man than Aeschines, and come of better men, if I and mine are no worse than any other respectable persons, to use no offensive expression, then do not trust him even in regard to other points, for it is plain that all he has said 
was equally fictitious. But once more accord me today the goodwill throughout the past that you have so often displayed towards me in previous trials. Knave as you are, Eskines, you were assuredly more fool than knave when you thought that I should dismiss all that I had to say with regard to my past acts and political life, and should turn to meet the abuse that fell from you. I shall not do so. I am not so brain-sick, but I will review the falsehoods and the calumnies which you uttered against my political career, and then, if the court desires it, I will afterwards refer to the ribald language that has been so incontinently used. The offenses charged against me are many, and for some of them the laws assign heavy and even the most extreme penalties, but I will tell you what is the motive which animates the present suit, gives play to the malice of a personal enemy, to his insolence, his abuse, his contumelies, and his every expression of his hostility. And yet, assuming that the charges and the imputations which have been made are true, does not enable the state to exact a penalty that is adequate or nearly adequate to the offenses. For it is not right to seek to debar another from coming before the people and receiving a hearing, nor to do so in the spirit of malice and envy. Heaven knows it is neither straightforward nor citizen-like nor just men of Athens. If the crimes by which he saw me injuring the city were of such a magnitude as he now so theatrically set forth, he should have had recourse to the punishments enjoined by the laws at the times of the crimes themselves. If he saw me so acting as to deserve impeachment, he should have impeached me, and so brought me to trial before you. If he saw me proposing illegal measures, he should have indicted me for the illegality. For surely, if he can prosecute Tessifin on my account, he would not have failed to indict me in person, had he thought that he could convict me. And further, if he saw me committing any of these other crimes against you, which he just now slanderously enumerated, or any other crimes whatsoever, there are laws which deal with each, and punishments and lawsuits and judgments involving penalties that are harsh and severe. To all of these he could have had recourse, and from the moment when it was seen that he had acted so, and had conducted his hostilities against me on this plan, his present accusation of me would have been in line with his past conduct. But as it is, he has forsaken the straight path of justice. He has shrunk from all attempts to convict me at the time. And after all these years, with the imputations, the jests, the invectives that he has accumulated, he appears to play his part. So it is that though his accusations are against me, it is Tessifin that he prosecutes, and though he sets his quarrel with me in the forefront of the whole suit, he has never faced me in person to settle the quarrel, and it is another whom we see him trying to deprive of his civil rights. Yet surely, besides everything else that may be pleaded on behalf of Tessifin, this, I think, may surely be most reasonably urged, that we ought in justice to have brought our own quarrel to the test by ourselves, instead of avoiding all conflict with one another, and looking for a third party to whom we could harm. Such iniquity really passes all bounds. From this one may see the nature of all his charges alike, uttered as they have been, without justice or regard for the truth. Yet I desire also to examine them severally, and more particularly the false statements which he made against me in regard to the peace and the embassy, when he ascribed to me the things that he had done himself in conjunction with Philocrates. And here it is necessary, men of Athens, and perhaps appropriate, that I should remind you of the state of affairs subsisting during that period, so that you may view each group of actions in the light of the circumstances of the time. When the Phocian War had broken out, not through any action of mine, for I had not yet entered public life, your own attitude in the first place was such that you wished for the preservation of the Phocians, although you saw that their actions were unjustifiable. While you would have been delighted at anything that might happen to the Thebans, against whom you felt an indignation that was neither unreasonable nor unfair, for they had not used their good fortune at Leuctra with moderation, and in the second place the Peloponnese was all disunited. Those who detested the Spartans were not strong enough to annihilate them, and those who had previously governed with the support of Sparta were no longer able to maintain their control over their cities. But both these and all the other states were in a condition of indeterminate strife and confusion. When Philip saw this, for it was not hard to see, he tried by dispensing money to the traders whom each state contained to throw them all into collision and stir up one against the other. And thus, amid the blunders and the perversity of others, he was making his own preparations and growing great to the danger of all. When it became clear to all that the then overbearing but now unhappy Thebans, distressed by the length of the war, would be forced to fly to you for aid, Philip, to prevent this, to prevent the formation of any union between the cities, made offers of peace to you and of assistance to them. Now, what was it that helped him and enabled him to find in you his almost willing dupes? It was the baseness, if that is the right name to use, or the ignorance, or both, of the rest of the Hellenes, who, though you were engaged in a long, continuous war, and that on behalf of the interest of all, as has been proved by the event, neither assisted you with the money or men, or in any other way whatsoever, and in your just and proper indignation with them, you listened readily to Philip. 
It was for these reasons, therefore, not through any action of mine, that the peace which we then conceded was negotiated. And anyone who investigates the matter honestly will find that it is the crimes and the corrupt practices of these men in the course of negotiations that are responsible for our position today. It is in the interests of truth that I enter into all these events with this exactitude and thoroughness, for however strong the appearance of criminality in these proceedings may be, it has, I imagine, nothing to do with me. The first man to suggest or mention the piece was Aristodemus, the actor, and the person who took the matter up and moved the motion and sold his services for the purpose, along with Aeschines, was Philocrates of Hanyas. Your partner, Aeschines, not mine, even if you split your sides with lying, while those who supported him from whatever motive, for of that I say nothing at present, were Eubulus and Sesosophon. I had no part in the matter anywhere. And yet, although the facts are such that as with absolute truth I am representing them to be, he carried his effrontery so far as to dare to assert that I was not only responsible for the peace, but had also prevented the city from acting in conjunction with the general assembly of the Hellenes in making it. What? And you? Ugh. How can one find a name that can be applied to you? When you saw me, for you were there, preventing the city from taking this great step and forming so grand an alliance as you just now described, did you once raise a protest or come forward to give information and to set forth the crimes with which you now charge me? If I had covenanted with Philip for money that I would prevent the coalition of the Hellenes, your only course was to refuse to keep silence, to cry aloud, to protest, to reveal the fact to your fellow countrymen. On no occasion did you do this. No such utterance of yours was ever heard by anyone. In fact, there was no embassy away at the time on a mission to any Hellenic state. The Hellenes had long ago been tried and found wanting, and in all that he has said upon this matter, there is not a single sound word. And, apart from all that, his falsehoods involved the greatest calumnies upon this city. For if you were at one and the same time convoking the Hellenes with a view to war, and sending ambassadors yourselves to Philip to discuss peace, it was a deed for your abatus, not a task for a state or for honest men that you were carrying out. But that is not the case. Indeed, it is not. For what could possibly have been your object in summoning them at that moment? Was it with a view to peace, that they all had peace already, or with a view to war? But you were yourselves discussing peace. It is therefore evident that neither was it that I introduced or was responsible for the peace in its original shape, nor is one of all the other falsehoods which he had told of me shown to be true. Again, consider the course of action which, when the city had concluded the peace, each of us now chose to adopt. For from this you will know who it was that cooperated with Philip throughout, and who it was that acted in your interest and sought the good of the city. As for me, I proposed, as a member of the council, that the ambassadors should sail as quickly as possible to any district in which they should ascertain Philip to be, and receive his oath from him. But even when I had carried this resolution, they would not act upon it. What did this mean, men of Athens? I will inform you. Philip's interest required that the interval before he took the oath should be as long as possible, yours that it should be as short as possible. And why? Because you broke off all your preparations for the war, not merely from the day when he took the oath, but from the day when you first hoped that peace would be made, and for his part, this was what he was all along working for, for he thought, and with truth, that whatever places he could snatch from Athens before he took the oath would remain securely his, since no one would break the peace for their sake. For seeing and calculating upon this men of Athens, I proposed this decree, that we should sail to any district in which Philip might be, and receive his oath as soon as possible, in order that the oaths might be taken while the Thracians, your allies, were still in possession of those strongholds of which Aeschines just spoke now with contempt, Sarium, Myrtinum, and Ergeski, and that Philip might not snatch from us the keys of the country and make himself master of Thrace, nor obtain an abundant supply of money and of soldiers, and so proceed without difficulty to the prosecution of his further designs. And now, instead of citing or reading this decree, he slanders me on the ground that I have thought fit, as member of the council, to introduce the envoys. But what should I have done? Was I to propose not to introduce those who had come for the express purpose of speaking with you, or to order the lessee of the theatre not to assign them seats? But they would have watched the play from the three penny seats, if this decree had not been proposed. Should I have guarded the interests of the city in petty details, and sold them wholesale, as my opponents did? Surely not. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now take this decree, which the prosecutor passed over, though he knew it well, and read it. The decree of Demosthenes is read. Though I had carried this decree, and was seeking the good not of Philip, but of the city, those worthy ambassadors paid little heed to it, but sat idle in Macedonia for three whole months, until Philip had arrived from Thasse, after subduing the whole country, when they might, within ten days, or equally well within three or four, have reached the Hellspot and saved the strongholds by receiving his oath before he could seize them. 
for he would not have touched them when we were present, or else if he had done so, we should have refused to administer the oath to him, and in that case he would have failed to obtain the peace, he would not have had both the peace and the strongholds as well. Such was Philip's first act of fraud during the time of the embassy, and the first instance of venality on the part of these wicked men. And over this I confess that then and now and always I have been and am at war and at variance with them. Now observe, immediately after this, a second and even greater piece of villainy. As soon as Philip had sworn to the peace, after first gaining possession of Thrace because these men did not obey my decree, he obtained from them, again by purchase, the postponement of our departure from Macedonia, until all should be in readiness for his campaign against the Phocians, in order that, instead of our bringing home a report of his intentions and his preparations for the march, which would make you set out and sail round to Thermopylae with your warships as you did before, you might only hear our report of the facts when he was already on this side of Thermopylae, and you could do nothing. And Philip was beset with such fear and such a weight of anxiety, lest in spite of his occupation of these places, his object had slipped from his grasp, if, before the Phocians were destroyed, he resolved to assist them, that he hired this despicable creature, not now in company with his colleagues, but by himself alone, to make to you a statement and a report of such a character that, owing to them, all was lost. But I request and entreat you, men of Athens, to remember throughout this whole trial that, had Aeschines made no accusation that was not included in the indictment, I too would not have said a word that did not bear upon it. But since he has had recourse to all kinds of imputation and slander at once, I am compelled also to give a brief answer to each group of charges. What then were the statements uttered by him that day, in consequence of which all was lost? You must not be perturbed, he said, at Philip's having crossed to this side of Thermopylae, for you will get everything that you desire if you remain quiet, and within two or three days you will hear that he has become the friend of those whose enemy he was, and the enemy of those whose friend he was when he first came. For, said he, it is not the phrases that confirm friendships, a finely sententious expression, but identity of interest, and it is to the interest of Philip, and of the Phocians, and of yourselves alike, to be rid of the heartless and overbearing demeanor of the Thebans. To these statements some gave a ready ear, in consequence of the tacit ill-feeling towards the Thebans at the time. What then followed, and not after a long interval, but immediately, the Phocians were overthrown, their cities were razed to the ground, you, who had believed Aeschines and remained inactive, were soon afterwards bringing in your effects from the country, while Aeschines received his gold, and besides all this, the city reaped the ill-will of the Thebans and the Thessalians, while their gratitude for what had been done went to Philip. To prove that this is so, Demosthenes says to the clerk, read me both the decree of Calisthenes and Philip's letter, Demosthenes to the jury, these two documents together will make all the facts plain, Demosthenes to the clerk, read. The decree of Calisthenes is read. Were these the hopes on the strength of which you made the peace? Was this what this hireling promised you? Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read the letter which Philip sent after this. Philip's letter is read. You hear how obviously in this letter sent to you, Philip is addressing definite information to his own allies. I have done these things, he tells them, against the will of the Athenians, and to their annoyance. And so, men of Thebes and Thessaly, if you are wise, you will regard them as enemies, and will trust me. He does not write in those actual terms, but that is what he intends to indicate. By these means he so carried them away, they did not foresee or realize any of the consequences, but allowed him to get everything into his own power, and that is why, poor men, they have experienced their present calamities. But the man who helped him create this confidence, who cooperated with him, who brought home that false report and deluded you, he it is who now bewails the sufferings of the Thebans and enlarges upon their piteousness, he who is himself the cause both of these and of the misery of Phocis, and of all the other evils which the Hellenes have endured. Yes, it is evident that you are pained at what has come to pass, Aeschines, and that you are sorry for the Thebans when you have property in Boeotia and are farming the land that was theirs, and that I rejoice at, I, whose surrender was immediately demanded by the author of the disaster but I have digressed into subjects of which it will perhaps be more convenient to speak presently. I will return to the proofs which show that it is the crimes of these men that are the cause of our condition today. For when you had been deceived by Philip through the agency of these men, who while serving as ambassadors had sold themselves and made a report in which there was not a word of truth, when the unhappy Phocians had been deceived and their cities annihilated, what followed? The despicable Thessalians and the slow-witted Thebans regarded Philip as their friend, their benefactor, their savior. Philip was there all in all. They would not even listen to the voice of anyone who wished to express a different opinion. 
You yourselves, though you viewed what had been done with suspicion and vexation, nevertheless kept the peace, for there was nothing else that you could have done. And the other Hellenes, who, like yourselves, have been deluded and disappointed of their hopes, also kept the peace. And gladly, since in a sense they were also remotely aimed at by the war. For when Philip was going about and subduing the Illyrians and Triboli and some of the Hellenes as well, and bringing many of the large forces into his own power, and when some of the members of the several states were taking advantage of the peace to travel to Macedonia, and were being corrupted, Aeschines among them, at such a time all of those whom Philip had in view in thus making his preparations were really being attacked by him. Whether they failed to realize it is another question which does not concern me, for I was continually uttering warnings and protests, both in your midst and wherever I was sent, but the cities were stricken with disease. Those who were engaged in political and practical affairs were taking bribes and being corrupted by the hope of money, while the mass of private citizens either showed no foresight or else were caught by the bait of ease and leisure from day to day, and all alike had fallen victims to some such delusive fancy as that the danger would come upon everyone but themselves, and that through the perils of others they would be able to secure their own position as they pleased. And so, I suppose, it has come to pass that the masses have atoned for their great and ill-timed indifference by the loss of their freedom, while the leaders in affairs, who fancied that they were selling everything except themselves, have realized that they had sold themselves first of all. For instead of being called friends and guest friends, as they were called at the time when they were taking bribes, they now hear themselves called flatterers, and godforsaken, and all the other names that they deserve. For no one, men of Athens, spends his money out of a desire to benefit the trader nor when once he has secured the object for which he bargains does he employ the trader to advise him with regard to other objects if it were so nothing could be happier than a trader but it is not so of course far from it when the aspirant after dominion has gained his object he is also the master of those who have sold it to him and because then he knows their villainy he then hates and mistrusts them and covers them with insults for observe for even if the time of the events is past the time for realizing truths like these is ever present to wise men lastines was called his friend but only until he had betrayed olynthus and timolaus but only until he had destroyed thebes and eudesus and simus of larissa but only until they had put thessaly in philip's power and now persecuted as they are and insulted and subjected to every kind of misery the whole inhabited world has become filled with such men and what of aristratus of sicyon what a perillus of megara are they not outcasts from these instances one can see very clearly that it is he who best protects his own country and speaks most constantly against such men that secures for traitors and hirelings like yourselves aeschines the continuance of your opportunities for taking bribes it is the majority of those who are here those who resist your will that you must thank for the fact that you live and draw your pay for left to yourselves you would long ago have perished there is still much that i might say about the transactions of that time but i think that even what i have said is more than enough the blame rests to the Iskines, who has drenched me with the stale dregs of his own villainy and crime from which i was compelled to clear myself in the eyes of those who are too young to remember the events though perhaps you who knew even before i said a single word of Iskines's service as a hireling may have felt some annoyance as you listened he calls it forsooth friendship and guess friendship somewhere in his speech just now he used the expression the man who casts in my teeth my guest friendship with alexander i cast in your teeth your guest friendship with alexander how did you acquire it how came you to be thought worthy of it never would i call you the guest friend of philip or the friend of alexander i am not so insane unless you are to call harvesters and other hired servants the friends and guest friends of those who have hired them but that is not the case of course far from it nay i call you the hireling formerly of philip and now of alexander and so do all who are present if you disbelieve me ask them or rather i'll ask them for you men of athens do you think of aeschines as the hireling or as the guest friend of alexander you hear what they say end of section twenty five recording by roger Surling. Section 26 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Part 2. 
I now wish, without more delay, to make my defense upon the indictment itself, and to go through my past acts, in order that Aeschines may hear, though he knows them well, the grounds on which I claim to have a right, both to the gifts which the council has proposed, and even far greater than these. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now take the indictment and read it. The indictment is read. These men of Athens are the points in the resolution which the prosecutor assails, and these very points will, I think, afford me my first means of proving to you that the defense which I am about to offer is an absolutely fair one, for I will take the points of the indictment in the very same order as the prosecutor. I will speak of each in succession, and will knowingly pass over nothing. Any decision upon the statement that I, quote, consistently do and say what is best for the people, and am eager to do whatever good I can, end quote, and upon the proposal to vote me thanks for this, depends, I consider, upon my past political career. For it is by an investigation of my career that either the truth and the propriety, or else the falsehood, of these statements which Tessifin has made about me will be discovered. Again, the proposal to crown me without the addition of the clause, quote, when he has submitted to his examination, end quote, and the order to proclaim the award of the crown in the theatre, must, I imagine, stand or fall with my political career. For the question is whether I deserve the crown and the proclamation before my fellow countrymen or not. At the same time, I consider myself further bound to point out to you the laws under which the defendant's proposal could be made. In this honest and straightforward manner, men of Athens, I have determined to make my defense, and now I will proceed to speak of my past actions themselves. And let no one imagine that I am detaching my argument from its connection with the indictment if I break into a discussion of international transactions. For it is the prosecutor who, by assailing the clause of the decree which states that I do and say what is best, and by indicting it as false, has rendered the discussion of my whole political career essentially germane to the indictment. And further, out of the many careers which public life offers, it was the Department of International Affairs that I chose, so that I have a right to derive my proofs also from that department. I will pass over all that Philip snatched from us and secured in the days before I took part in public life as an orator. None of these losses, I imagine, has anything to do with me. But I will recall to you, and will render you an account of all that, from the day I entered upon this career, he was prevented from taking, when I have made one remark. Philip, men of Athens, had a great advantage in his favor, for in the midst of the Hellenic peoples, and not of some only, but of all alike, there had sprung up a crop of traitors, corrupt, godforsaken men, more numerous than they have ever been in the memory of man. These he took to help and cooperate with him, and great as the mutual ill will and dissensions of the Hellenes already were, he rendered them even worse, by deceiving some, making presents to others, and corrupting others in every way, and at a time when all had in reality but one interest, to prevent his becoming powerful, he divided them into a number of factions. All the Hellenes then being in this condition, still ignorant of the growing and accumulating evil, you have to ask yourselves, men of Athens, what policy and action it was fitting for the city to choose, and to hold me responsible for this. For the person who assumed that responsibility in the state was myself. Should she, Aeschines, have sacrificed her pride and her own dignity? Should she have joined the ranks of the Thessalians and Dolopes, and helped Philip to acquire the empire of Hellas, cancelling thereby the noble and righteous deeds of our forefathers? Or, if she should not have done this, for it would have been in very truth an atrocious thing, should she have looked on, while all that she saw would happen if no one prevented it, all that she realized, it seems, at a distance, was actually taking place? Nay, I should be glad to ask today the severest critic of my actions, which party he would have desired the city to join, the party which shares the responsibility for the misery and disgrace which has fallen upon the Hellenes, the party of the Thessalians and their supporters, one may call it, or the party which looked on while these calamities were taking place, in the hope of gaining some advantage for themselves, in which we should place the Arcadians and Mycenaeans and Argives. But even of these, many, nay, all, have in the end fared worse than we. For if Philip had departed immediately after his victory, and gone his way, if afterwards he had remained at peace, and had given no trouble whatever to any of his own allies or of the other Hellenes, then there would have been some ground for blaming and accusing those who had opposed his plans. But if he has stripped them all alike of their dignity, their paramountcy, and their independence, nay, even of their free constitutions, wherever he could do so, can it be denied that the policy which you adopted on my advice was the most glorious policy possible? But I return to my former point. What was it fitting for the city to do, Aeschines, when she saw Philip establishing for himself a despotic sway over the Hellenes? What language should have been used, what measures proposed, by the adviser of the people at Athens, for that it was at Athens, makes the utmost difference. 
when I knew that from the very first up to the day when I myself ascended the platform that my country had always contended for preeminence, honor, and glory, and in the cause of honor, and for the interests of all, had sacrificed more money and lives than any other Hellenic people had spent for their private ends. When I saw that Philip himself, with whom our conflict lay, for the sake of empire and absolute power, had had his eye knocked out, his collarbone broken, his hand and his leg maimed, and was ready to resign any part of his body that fortune chose to take from him, provided that with what remained he might live in honor and glory. And surely no one would dare to say that it was fitting that in one bread of Pella, a place then inglorious and insignificant, there should have grown up so lofty a spirit that he aspired after the empire of Hellas, and conceived such a project in his mind but that in you who are athenians and who day by day in all that you hear and see behold the memorials of the gallantry of your forefathers such baseness should be found that you would yield up your liberty to philip by your own deliberate offer and deed no man would say this one alternative remained and that one which you were bound to take that of a righteous resistance to the whole course of action by which he was doing you injury you acted thus from the first quite rightly and properly while i helped by my proposals and advice during the time of my political activity and i do not deny it but what ought i to have done for the time has come to ask you this aeschines and to dismiss everything else amphipolis pydna potidea halinesis are all blotted from my memory as for cerium boriscus the sack of Peperithus, and all the other injuries inflicted upon the city i renounce all knowledge of their ever having happened though you actually said that i involved my countrymen in hostility by talking of these things when the decrees which deal with them were the work of eubulus aristophan and diopithes and not mine at all so glibly do you assert anything that suits your purpose but of this too i say nothing at present i only ask you whether philip who was appropriating euboa and establishing it as a stronghold to command attica who was making an attempt upon megara seizing oreus raising the walls of porthmus setting out philistides at oreus and clitarchus at eritrea bringing up the hellespont into his own power besieging byzantium destroying some of the cities of hellas and restoring his exiled friends to others whether he i say in acting thus was guilty of wrong violating the truce and breaking the peace or not was it fit that one of the hellenes should arise to prevent it or not if it was not fit if it was fit that hellas should become like the mesian booty in the proverb before men's eyes while the athenians had life and being then i have lost my labour in speaking upon this theme and the city has lost its labour in obeying me then let everything that has been done be counted for a crime and a blunder and those my own but if it was right that one should arise to prevent it for whom could the task be more fitting than for the people of athens that then was the aim of my policy and when i saw philip reducing all mankind to servitude i opposed him and without ceasing warned and exhorted you to make no surrender but the peace aeschines was in reality broken by philip when he seized the corn ships not by athens demosthenes to the clerk bring the decrees themselves and the letter of philip and read them in order demosthenes to the jury for they will make it clear who is responsible and for what the decree is read this decree then was proposed by eubulus not by me and the next by aristophan he is followed first by hegesippus and he by aristophan again and then by philocrates then by sisosophan and then by all of them but i propose no decree upon this subject demosthenes to the clerk read decrees are read as then i point to these decrees so aeschines do you point to a decree of any kind proposed by me which makes me responsible for the war you cannot do so for had you been able there is nothing which you would sooner have produced indeed even philip himself makes no charge against me as regards the war though he complains of others demosthenes to the clerk read philip's letter itself philip's letter is read in this letter he has nowhere mentioned the name demosthenes nor made any charge against me why is it then that though he complains of others he has not mentioned my own actions because if he had written anything about me he must have mentioned his own acts of wrong for it was these acts upon which i kept my grip and these which i opposed first of all when he was trying to steal into the peloponnese i proposed the embassy to the peloponnese then when he was grasping at euboa the embassy to euboa then the expedition not an embassy any more to oreus and that to eritrea when he had established tyrants in those cities after that i dispatched all the naval expeditions in the course of which the Chersonese and byzantium and all our allies were saved 
In consequence of this, the noblest rewards at the hands of those who have benefited by your action became yours. Votes of thanks, glory, honors, crowns, gratitude. While of the victims of his aggression, those who followed your advice at the time secured their own deliverance, and those who neglected it had the memory of your warnings constantly in their minds, and regarded you not merely as their well-wishers, but as men of wisdom and prophetic insight, for all that you foretold has come to pass. And further, that Philistines would have given a large sum to retain Aureus, and Cletarchus to retain Eritrea, and Philip himself, to be able to count upon the use of these places against you, and to escape all exposure of his other proceedings and all investigation by any one in any place of his wrongful acts, all this is not unknown to any one, least of all to you, Aeschines. For the envoys sent to that time by Clitarchus and Philistides lodged at your house when they came here, and you acted as their patron. Though the city rejected them as enemies whose proposals were neither just nor expedient, to you they were friends none of their attempts succeeded slander me though you may when you assert that i say nothing when i receive money but cry out when i spend it that certainly is not your way for you cry out with money in your hands and will never cease unless those present cause you to do so by taking away your civil rights to-day now on that occasion gentlemen you crown me for my conduct aristonicus proposed a decree whose very syllables were identical with those of Tesiphon's present proposal the crown was proclaimed in the theatre and this was already the second proclamation in my honour and yet aeschines though he was there neither opposed the decree nor indicted the mover demosthenes to the clerk take this decree also and read it the decree of aristonicus is read now is any of you aware of any discredit that attached itself to the city owing to this decree did any mockery or ridicule ensue such as aeschines said must follow on the present occasion if i were crowned but surely when proceedings are recent and well known to all then it is that if they are satisfactory they meet with gratitude and if they are otherwise with punishment it appears then that on that occasion i met with gratitude not with blame or punishment thus the fact that up to the time when these events took place i acted throughout as was best for the city has been acknowledged by the victory of my advice and my proposals in your deliberations by the successful execution of the measures which i proposed and the award of crowns in consequence of them to the city and to myself and to all and by your celebration of sacrifices to the gods and processions in thankfulness for these blessings when philip had been expelled from euboea and while the arms which expelled him were yours the statesmanship and the decrees even though some of my opponents may split their sides were mine he proceeded to look for some other stronghold from which he could threaten the city and seeing that we were more dependent than any other people upon imported corn and wishing to get our corn trade into his power he advanced to thrace first he requested the byzantines his own allies to join him in the war against you and when they refused and said with truth they had not made their alliance with him for such a purpose he erected a stockade against the city brought up his engines and proceeded to besiege it i will not ask again what you ought to have done when this was happening it is manifest to all but who was it that went to the rescue of the byzantines and saved them who was it that prevented the hellespont from falling into other hands at that time it was you men of athens and when i say you i mean this city and who was it that spoke and moved resolutions and acted for the city and gave himself up unsparingly to the business of the state it was i but of the immense benefit thus conferred upon all you no longer need words of mine to tell you since you have had actual experience of it for the war which then ensued apart from the glorious reputation that had brought you kept you supplied with the necessaries of life in greater plenty and at lower prices than the present peace which these worthy men are guarding to their country's detriment in the hopes of something yet to be realized may those hopes be disappointed may they share the fortune which you who wish for the best ask of the gods rather than cause you to share that upon which their own choice is fixed demosthenes to the clerk read out to the jury the crowns awarded to the city in consequence of our action by the byzantines and by the perinthians the decree of the byzantines is read read out also the crowns awarded by the peoples of the chersonese the decree of the peoples of the chersonese is read thus the policy which i had adopted was not only successful in saving the chersonese and byzantium and preventing the hellespont from falling at that time into the power of philip and in bringing honours to the city in consequence but it revealed to the whole world the noble gallantry of athens and the baseness of philip for all saw that he the ally of the byzantines was besieging them what could be more shameful or revolting 
and on the other hand it was seen that you who might fairly have urged many well-founded complaints against them for their inconsiderate conduct towards you at an earlier period not only refused to remember your grudge and to abandon the victims of aggression but actually delivered them and in consequence of this you won glory and good will on all hands and further though every one knows that you have crowned many public men before now no one can name any but myself that is to say any public counsellor and orator for whose merits the city has received a crown in order to prove to you also that the slanders which he uttered against the euboans and the byzantines as he recalled to you any ill-natured action that they had taken towards you in the past are disingenuous calumnies not only because they are false for this i think you may all be assumed to know but also because however true they might be it was still to your advantage to deal with the political situation as i have done i desire to describe in that briefly one or two of the noble deeds which the city has done in your own time for an individual and a state should strive always in their respective spheres to fashion their future conduct after the highest examples that their past affords thus men of athens at a time when the spartans were masters of land and sea and were retaining their hold by means of governors and garrisons upon the country all round attica euboa tanagra all boeotia megara aegina chios and the other islands and when athens possessed neither ships nor walls you marched forth to heliardus and again not many days later to corinth though the athenians of that day might have borne a heavy grudge against both the corinthians and the thebans for the part that they had played in reference to the decalian war but they bore no such grudge far from it and neither of these actions Iskines, was taken by them to help benefactors nor was the prospect before them free from danger yet they did not on that account sacrifice those who fled to them for help for the sake of glory and honour they were willing to expose themselves to the danger and it was a right and a noble spirit that inspired their counsels for the life of all men must end in death though a man shut himself in a chamber and keep watch but brave men must ever set themselves to do that which is noble with their joyful hope for their buckler and whatsoever god gives must bear it gallantly thus did your forefathers and thus did the elder among yourselves for although the spartans were no friends or benefactors of yours but had done much grievous wrong to the city yet when the thebans after the victory at leuctra attempted to annihilate them you prevented it not terrified by the strength or the reputation which the thebans then enjoyed nor reckoning up what the men had done to you for whom you were to face this peril and thus as you know you revealed to all the hellenes that whatever offences may be committed against you though under all other circumstances you show your resentment of them yet if any danger to life or freedom overtakes the transgressors you will bear no grudge and make no reckoning nor was it in these instances only that you were thus disposed for once more when the thebans were appropriating euboa you did not look on while it was done you did not call to mind the wrong which had been done to you in the matter of oropus by themison and theodorus you helped even these and it was then that the city for the first time had voluntary triarchs of whom i was one but i will not speak of this yet and although to save the island was itself a noble thing to do it was yet a nobler thing by far that when their lives and their cities were absolutely in your power you gave them back as it was right to do to the very men who had offended against you and made no reckoning when such trust had been placed in you of the wrongs which you had suffered i pass by the innumerable instances which i might give battles at sea expeditions by land or campaigns both long ago and now in our day in all of which the object of the city has been to defend the freedom and safety of the other hellenic peoples and so when in all these striking examples i had beheld the city ever ready to strive in defence of the interests of others what was i likely to bid her do what action was i likely to recommend to her when the debate to some extent concerned her own interests why you would say to remember her grudge against those who wanted deliverance and to look for excuses for sacrificing everything and who would not have been justified in putting me to death if i had attempted to bring shame upon the city's high traditions though it were only by word the deed itself you would never have done i know full well for had you desired to do it what was there to hinder you were you not free so to act had you not these men here to propose it i wish now to return to the next in succession of my political acts and here again you must ask yourselves what was the best thing for the city for men of athens when i saw that your navy was breaking up and that while the rich were obtaining exemption on the strength of small payments citizens of moderate or small means were losing all that they had and further that in consequence of these things the city was always missing her opportunities i enacted a law in accordance with which i compelled the former the rich to do their duty fairly 
I put an end to the injustice done to the poor, and, what was the greatest service of all to the state, I caused our preparations to be made in time. When I was indicted for this, I appeared before you at the ensuing trial, and was acquitted. The prosecutor failed to obtain the necessary fraction of the votes. But what sums do you think the leaders of the taxation boards, or those who stood second or third, offered me to induce me, if possible, not to enact the law, or at least to let it drop and lie under sworn notice of prosecution? They offered me some so large men of Athens that I should hesitate to mention them to you, it was a natural course for them to take for under the former laws it was possible for them to divide their obligation between sixteen persons paying little or nothing themselves and grinding down their poorer fellow-citizens while by my law each must pay down a sum calculated in proportion to his property and a man came to be charged with two warships who had previously been one of sixteen subscribers to a single one for they used it now to call themselves no longer captains of their ships but subscribers thus there was nothing that they were not willing to give if only the new plan could be brought to nothing and they could escape being compelled to do their duty fairly demosthenes to the clerk now read me first the decree in accordance with which i had to meet the indictment and then the lists of those liable under the former law and under my own respectively read the decree is read now produce that noble list a list is read now produce for a comparison with this the list under my own law a list is read was this think you but a trifling assistance which i rendered to the poor among you would the wealthy have spent but a trifling sum to avoid doing their duty fairly i am proud not only of having refused all compromise upon the measure not only of having been acquitted when i was indicted but also of having enacted a law which was beneficial and of having given proof of it in practice for throughout the war the armaments were equipped under my law and no trierarch ever laid the suppliant's branch before you in token of grievance nor took sanctuary at Munichia. None was imprisoned by the Admiralty Board. No warship was abandoned at sea and lost to the state, or left behind here as unseaworthy. Under the former laws, all these things used to happen. And the reason was that the obligation rested upon the poor, and in consequence there were many cases of inability to discharge it. I transferred the duties of the triarchy from the poor to the rich, and therefore every duty was properly fulfilled. I, and for this very reason, I deserve to receive praise that I always adopted such political measures as brought with them accessions of glory and honor and power to the city. No measure of mine is malicious, harsh, or unprincipled. None is degrading or unworthy of the city. The same spirit will be seen both in my domestic and my international policy. Just as in home affairs I did not set the favor of the rich above the rights of the many, so in international affairs I did not embrace the gifts and the friendship of Philip in preference to the common interests of all the Hellenes it still remains for me i suppose to speak about the proclamation and about my examination the statement that i acted for the best and that i am loyal to you throughout and eager to do you good service i have proved i think sufficiently by what i have said at the same time i am passing over the most important parts of my political life and actions for i conceive that i ought first to render you in their proper order my arguments in regard to the alleged illegality itself which done, even if I say nothing about the rest of my political acts, I can still rely upon that personal knowledge of them which each of you possesses. Of the arguments which the prosecutor jumbled together in utter confusion with reference to the laws accompanying his indictment, I am quite certain that you could not follow the greater part, nor could I understand them myself, but I will simply address you straightforwardly upon the question of right. So far am I from claiming, as he just now slanderously declared, to be free from the liability to render an account that i admit a lifelong liability to account for every part of my administration and policy but i do not admit that i am liable for one single day you hear me aeschines to account for what i have given to the people as a free will offering out of my private estate nor is any one else so liable not even if he is one of the nine archons what law is so replete with injustice and churlishness that when a man has made a present out of his private property and done an act of generosity and munificence it deprives him of the gratitude due to him hails him before a court of disingenuous critics and sets them to audit accounts of sums which he himself has given there is no such law if the prosecutor asserts that there is let him produce it and i will resign myself and say no more but the law does not exist, men of Athens, and this is nothing but an informer's trick on the part of Aeschines, who, because I was controller of the festival fund when I made this donation, says, quote, Tessaphon proposed a vote of thanks to him when he was still liable to account, end quote. 
The vote of thanks was not for any of the things for which I was liable to account. It was for my voluntary gift, and your charge is a misrepresentation. Yes, you say, but you were also a commissioner of fortifications. I was, and thanks were rightly accorded me on the very ground that, instead of charging the sums which I spent, I made a present of them. A statement of account, it is true, calls for an audit and scrutineers, but a free gift deserves gratitude and thanks, and that is why the defendant proposed this motion in my favor. That this principle is not merely laid down in the laws, or rooted in your national character, I should have no difficulty in proving by many instances. Nausicles, to begin with, has often been crowned by you, while general, for sacrifices he had made from his private funds. Again, when Diotimus gave the shields, and Charidamus afterwards, they were crowned. And again, Neoptolemus here, while still the rector of many public works, has received honors for his voluntary gifts. It would really be too bad if anyone who held any office must either be debarred thereby from making a present to the state, or else, instead of receiving due gratitude, must submit accounts of the sums given. To prove the truth of my statements, Demosthenes to the clerk, take and read the actual decrees which were passed in honor of these persons. Read. Two decrees are read. Each of these persons, Eskines, was accountable as regards the office which he held, but not as regards the services for which he was crowned. Nor am I, therefore, for I presume that I have the same rights as others with reference to the same matters. I made a voluntary gift. For this I receive thanks, for I am not liable to account for what I gave. I was holding office, true, and I have rendered an account of my official expenditure, but not of what I gave voluntarily. Ah, but I exercised my office iniquitously. What? And you were there, when the auditors brought me before them, and did not accuse me. Now that the court may see that the prosecutor himself bears me witness that I was crowned for services of which I was not liable to render an account, Demosthenes to the clerk, take and read the decree which was proposed in my honor in its entirety, Demosthenes to the jury. The points which he has omitted to indict in the counsel's resolution will show that the charges which he does make are deliberate misrepresentations, Demosthenes to the clerk, read. The decree is read. My donations, then, were these, of which you have not made one the subject of indictment. It is the reward for these which the council states to be my due, that you attack. You admit that it was legal to accept the gifts offered, and you indict as illegal the return of gratitude for them. In heaven's name, what must the perfect scoundrel, the really heaven-detested, malignant being be like? Must he not be a man like this? But as regards the proclamation in the theatre, I pass by the fact that ten thousand persons have been thus proclaimed on ten thousand different occasions, and that my own name has often been so proclaimed before. But in heaven's name, Eskines, are you so perverse and stupid that you cannot grasp the fact that the recipient of the crown feels the same pride wherever the crown is proclaimed, and that it is for the benefit of those who confer it that the proclamation is made in the theatre? for those who here are stimulated to do good service to the state, and commend those who return gratitude for such service even more than they commend the recipient of the crown. That is why the city has enacted this law. Demosthenes to the clerk. Take the law itself and read it. The law is read. Do you hear, Eskines, the plain words of the law? Quote, Except such as the people or the council shall resolve so to proclaim, but let these be proclaimed. End quote. Why, wretched man, do you lay this dishonest charge? Why do you invent false arguments? Why do you not take hellbore to cure you? What? Are you not ashamed to bring a case founded upon envy, not upon any crime, to alter some of the laws and to leave out parts of others, when they ought surely, in justice, to be read entire to those who have sworn to give their votes in accordance with the laws? And then, while you act in this way, you enumerate the qualities which should be found in a friend of the people, as if you had contracted for a statue, and discovered on receiving it that it had not the features required by the contract, or as if a friend of the people was known by a definition, and not by his works and his political measures. And you shout out expressions, proper and improper, like a reveller on a cart, expressions which apply to you in your house, not to me. I will add this also, men of Athens. The difference between abuse and accusation is, I imagine, that an accusation is founded upon crimes, for which the penalties are assigned by law. Abuse, upon such slanders as their own character leads enemies to utter about one another. And I conceive that our forefathers built these courts of law, not that we might assemble you here and revile one another with improper expressions suggested by our adversary's private life, 
but that we might convict anyone who happens to have committed some crime against the state. Iskines knew this as well as I, and yet he chose to make a ribald attack instead of an accusation. At the same time, it is not fair that he should go off without getting as much as he gives, even in this respect, and when I have asked him one question, I will at once proceed to the attack. Are we to call you Iskines the enemy of the state, or of myself? Of myself, of course. What? And when you might have exacted the penalty from me on behalf of your fellow countrymen, according to the laws, at public examinations, by indictment, by all other forms of trial, did you always omit to do so? And yet today, when I am unassailable upon every ground, on the ground of law, of lapse of time, of the statutable limit, of the many previous trials which I have undergone upon every charge, without having once been convicted of any crime against you to this day, and when the city must necessarily share to a greater or a smaller degree in the glory of acts which were really the acts of the people, have you confronted me upon such an issue as this? Take care lest, while you profess to be my enemy, you prove to be the enemy of your fellow countrymen. End of section 26 Recording by Roger Serling Section 27 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Part 3. Since then I have shown you all what is the vote which religion and justice demand of you, I am now obliged, it would seem, by the slanders which he has uttered, though I am no lover of abuse, to reply to his many falsehoods by saying just what is absolutely necessary about himself, and showing who he is, and whence he is sprung, that he so lightly begins to use bad language, pulling to pieces certain expressions of mine, when he has himself used expressions which any respectable man would have shrunk from uttering. For if the accuser was Eacus or Radamantus or Minos, instead of a scandal-monger, an old hand in the marketplace, a pestilent clerk, I do not believe that he would have spoken thus, or produced such a stock of ponderous phrases, crying aloud as if he were acting a tragedy, quote, O earth and sun and virtue, end quote, and the like, or again invoking, quote, wit and culture, by which things noble and base are discerned apart, end quote. For, of course, you heard him speaking in this way. Scum of the earth, what have you or yours to do with virtue? How should you discern what is noble and what is not? Where and how did you get your qualification to do so? What right have you to mention culture anywhere? A man of genuine culture would not only never have asserted such a thing of himself, but would have blushed to hear another do so, and those who, like you, fall far short of it, but are tactless enough to claim it, succeed only in causing distress to their hearers when they speak not in seeming to be what they profess but though i am not at a loss to know what to say about you and yours i am at a loss to know what to mention first shall i tell first how your father tromes was a slave in the house of elpius who kept an elementary school near the temple of theseus and how he wore shackles at a wooden halter or how your mother by celebrating her daylight nuptials in her hut near the shrine of the hero of the lancet was enabled to rear you her beautiful statue the prince of third-rate actors but these things are known to all without my telling them. Shall I tell how Formio, the ship's piper, the slave of Dion of Feari, raised her up out of this noble profession? But before God in every heavenly power, I shudder lest in using expressions which are fitly applied to you, I may be thought to have chosen a subject upon which it ill befits myself to speak. So I'll pass this by, and will begin with the acts of his own life, for they were not like any chance actions, but such as the people curses. For only lately, lately, do I say, only yesterday or the day before, did he become at once an Athenian and an orator, and by the addition of two syllables converted his father from Tromes into a Tromedus, and gave his mother the imposing name of Glaucothea, when every one knows that she used to be called Empusa, a name which was obviously given her because there was nothing that she would not do or have done to her, for how else should she have acquired it? yet in spite of this you are of so ungrateful and villainous a nature that though thanks to your countrymen you have risen from slavery to freedom and from poverty to wealth far from feeling gratitude to them you devote your political activity to working against them as a hireling 
I will pass over every other case in which there is any room for the contention that he has spoken in the interests of the city, and will remind you of the acts which he has manifestly proved to have done for the good of her enemies. Which of you has not heard of Antiphon, who was struck off the list of citizens, and came into the city in pursuance of a promise to Philip that he would burn the dockyards? I found him concealed in Piraeus, and brought him before the assembly. But the malignant Aeschines shouted at the top of his voice that it was atrocious of me, in a democratic country, to insult a citizen who had met with misfortune, and to go to men's houses without a decree, and he obtained his release. And unless the council of Areopagus had taken notice of the matter, and, seeing the inopportuneness of the ignorance which you had shown, had made a further search for the man, and arrested him, and brought him before you again, a man of that character would have been snatched out of your hands, and would have evaded punishment, and been sent out of the country by this pompous orator. As it was, you tortured and executed him, and so ought you also to have treated Aeschines. The council of Areopagus knew the part which he had played in this affair, and for this reason, when, owing to the same ignorance which so often leads you to sacrifice the public interests, you elected him to advocate your claims in regard to the temple of Delos, the council, since you had appointed it to assist you, and entrusted it with full authority to act in the matter, immediately rejected Aeschines as a traitor, and committed the case to Hyperides. When the council took this step, the members took their votes from the altar, and not one vote was given for this abominable man. To prove what I say is true, Demosthenes to the clerk, call the witnesses who testified to it. The witnesses are called. Thus, when the council rejected him from the office of advocate and committed the case to another, it was declared at the same time that he was a traitor who wished you ill. Such was one of the public appearances of this fine fellow, and such its character. So like the acts with which he charges me, is it not? Now recall a second, for when Philip sent Pithon of Byzantium, and with him envoys from all his allies, in the hope of putting the city to shame and showing her to be in the wrong, I would not give way before the torrent of insolent rhetoric which Pithon poured out upon you, but rose and contradicted him, and would not betray the city's rights, but prove the iniquity of Philip's actions so manifestly that even his own allies rose up and admitted it. But Aeschines supported Pithon. He gave testimony in opposition to his country, and that testimony false. Nor was this sufficient for him, for again after this he was detected going to meet Anaxinus the spy in the house of Thrasin. But surely one who met the emissary of the enemy alone and conferred with him must himself have been already a born spy and enemy of his country. To prove the truth of what I say, Demosthenes to the clerk, call the witnesses to these facts. The witnesses are called. There are still an infinite number of things which I might relate of him, but I will pass them over, for the truth is something like this. I could still point to many instances in which he was found to be serving our enemies during that period, and showing his spite against me. But you do not store such things up in careful remembrance, to visit them with the indignation which they deserve. But, following a bad custom, you have given great freedom to anyone who wishes to trip up the proposer of any advantageous measure by dishonest charges bartering, as you do, the advantage of the state for the pleasure and gratification which you derive from invective. And so it is always easier and safer to be a hireling in the service of the enemy than a statesman who has chosen to defend your cause. To cooperate with Philip before we were openly at war with him was, I call earth and heaven to witness, atrocious enough. How could it be otherwise, against his own country? Nevertheless, concede him this, if you will, concede him this. But when the corn ships had been openly plundered, and the Chersonese was being ravaged, and the man was on the march against Attica, when the position of affairs was no longer in doubt, and war had begun, what action did this malignant mouther of verses ever do for your good? He can point to none. There is not a single decree, small or great, with reference to the interests of the city, standing in the name of Aeschines. If he asserts that there is, let him produce it in the time allotted to me. But no such decree exists. In that case, however, only two alternatives are possible. Either he had no fault to find at the time with my policy, and therefore made no proposal contrary to it, or else he was seeking the advantage of the enemy, and therefore refrained from bringing forward any policy better than mine. Did he then abstain from speaking, as he abstained from proposing any motion, when any mischief was to be done? On the contrary, no one else had a chance of speaking. But though, apparently, the city could endure everything else, and he could do everything else unobserved, there was one final deed which was the culmination of all that he had done before. Upon this he expended all that multitude of words, as he went through the decrees relating to the Amphysians in the hope of distorting the truth. But the truth cannot be distorted, 
It is impossible. Never will you wash away the stain of your actions there. You will not say enough for that. I call upon the gods and goddesses who protect this land of Attica, in the presence of you all, men of Athens, and upon Apollo of Pitho, the paternal deity of this city, and I pray to them all, that if I should speak the truth to you, if I spoke it at that very time without delay, in the presence of the people, when first I saw this abominable man setting his hand to the business, for I knew it, I knew it at once, that then they may give me good fortune and life. But if, to gratify my hatred or any private quarrel, I am now bringing a false accusation against this man, then they may take from me the fruition of every blessing. Why have I uttered this imprecation with such vehemence and earnestness? Because, although I have documents lying in the public archives by which I will prove the facts clearly, although I know that you remember what was done, I have still the fear that he may be thought too insignificant a man to have done all the evil which he has wrought, as indeed happened before when he caused the ruin of the unhappy Phocians by the false report which he brought home. For the war at Amphisa, which was the cause of Philip's coming to Elatea, and of one being chosen commander of the Amphictyons who overthrew the fortunes of the Hellenes, he it is who helped to get it up. He, in his sole person, is to blame for disasters to which no equal can be found. I protested at the time, and cried out before the assembly, quote, You are bringing war into Attica, Aeschines, an Amphictyonic war. End quote. But a packed group of his supporters refused to let me speak, while the rest were amazed, and imagined that I was bringing a baseless charge against him out of personal animosity. But what the true nature of these proceedings was, men of Athens, why this plan was contrived, and how it was executed, you must hear from me to-day, since you were prevented from doing so at the time. You will behold a business cunningly organized, you will advance greatly in your knowledge of public affairs, and you will see what cleverness there was in Philip. Philip had no prospect of seeing the end of the war with you, or ridding himself of it, unless he could make the Thebans and Thessalians enemies of Athens, for although the war was being wretchedly and inefficiently conducted by your generals, he was nevertheless suffering infinite damage from the war itself and from the freebooters the exportation of the produce of his country and the importation of what he needed were both impossible moreover he was not at that time superior to you at sea nor could he reach attica if the thessalians would not follow him or the thebans give him a passage through their country and although he was overcoming in the field the generals whom you sent out such as they were for of this i say nothing he found himself suffering from the geographical conditions themselves and from the nature of the resources which either side possessed now if he tried to encourage either the thessalians or the thebans to march against you in order to further his own quarrel no one he thought would pay any attention to him but if he adopted their own common grounds of action and were chosen commander he hoped to find it easier to deceive or to persuade them as the case might be what then does he do he attempts and observe with what skill to stir up an amphictyonic war and a disturbance in connection with the meaning of the council for he thought that they would at once find that they needed his help to deal with these now if one of his own or his allies representatives on the council brought the matter forward he thought that both the thebans and the thessalians would regard the proceeding with suspicion and that all would be on their guard but if it was an athenian sent by you his adversaries that did so would easily escape detection as in fact happened how then did he manage this he hired Aeschines. No one, I suppose, either realized beforehand what was going on, or guarded against it. That is how such affairs are usually conducted here. Aeschines was nominated a delegate to the council. Three or four people held up their hands for him, and he was declared elected. But when, bearing with him the prestige of this city, he reached the Amphictyons, he dismissed and closed his eyes to all other considerations, and proceeded to perform the task for which he had been hired. He composed and recited a story, in attractive language, of the way in which the Syrian territory had come to be dedicated, and with this he persuaded the members of the council, who were unused to rhetoric and did not foresee what was about to happen, that they should resolve to make the circuit of the territory, which the Amphysians said they were cultivating because it was their own, while he alleged that it was part of the consecrated land. The Locrians were not bringing any suit against us, or taking any such action as, in order to justify himself, he now falsely alleges you may know this from the following consideration it was clearly impossible for the locrians to bring a suit against athens to an actual issue without summoning us who then served the summons upon us before what authority was it served tell us who knows point to him you cannot do so it was a hollow and a false pretext of which you thus made a wrongful use
While the Invetions were making the circuit of the territory in accordance with Iskines' suggestion, the Locrians fell upon them and came near to shooting them all down with their spears. Some of the members of the council they even carried off with them, and now that complaints and hostilities have been stirred up against the Amphysians in consequence of these proceedings, the command was first held by Cotyphus, and his force was drawn from the Amphictyonic powers alone. But since some did not come, and those who came did nothing, the men who had been suborned for the purpose, villagers of long standing, chosen from the Thessalians and from the traders in other states, took steps with a view to entrusting the affair to Philip, as commander, at the meeting of the next council. They had adopted arguments of a persuasive kind. Either, they said, the Amphictyons must themselves contribute funds, maintain mercenaries, and find those who refuse to do so, or they must elect Philip. To make a long story short, the result was that Philip was appointed, and immediately afterwards, having collected a force and crossed the pass, ostensibly on his way to the territory of Syra, he bids a long farewell to the Syrians and the Locrians, and seizes Elatea. Now, if the Thebans had not changed their policy at once upon seeing this, and joined us, the trouble would have descended upon the city in full force, like a torrent in winter. As it was, the Thebans checked him for the moment, chiefly, men of Athens, through the good will of some heavenly power towards us but secondarily, so far as it lay in one man's power, through me also. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now give me the decrees in question, and the dates of each proceeding. Demosthenes to the jury. That you may know what trouble this abominable creature stirred up, unpunished. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read me the decrees. The decrees of the Amphictyons are read. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read the dates of these proceedings. Demosthenes to the jury. They are the dates at which Iskines was delegate to the council. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read. The dates are read. Now give me the letter which Philip sent to his allies in the Peloponnese when the Thebans failed to obey his summons, for from this too you may clearly see that he concealed the real reason for his action, the fact that he was taking measures against Hellas and the Thebans and yourselves, and pretended to represent the common cause and the will of the Amphictyons and the man who provided him with all these occasions and pretexts was Iskines. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read. Philip's letter is read. You see that he avoids the mention of his own reasons for action, and takes refuge in those provided by the Amphictyons. Who was it then that helped him to prepare such a case? Who put such pretexts at his disposal? Who is most to blame for the disasters that have taken place? Is it not Iskines? And so, men of Athens, you must not go about saying that Hellas has suffered such things as these at the hands of one man. I call earth and heaven to witness that it was at the hands, not of one man, but of many villains in each state. And of these, Aeschines is one. And, had I to speak the truth without any reserve, I should not hesitate to describe him as the incarnate curse of all alike, men, regions, or cities, that have been ruined since then. For he who supplied the seed is responsible for the crop. I wonder that you did not turn away your eyes at the very sight of him, but a cloud of darkness seems to hang between you and the truth. End of section 27. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 28 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Part 4. I find that in dealing with the measures taken by Aeschines for the injury of his country, I have reached the time when I must speak of my own statesmanship in opposition to these measures. And it is fair that you should listen to this, for many reasons but above all because it will be a shameful thing if when i have faced the actual realities of hard work for you you will not even suffer the story of them to be told for when i saw the thebans and i may almost say yourselves as well being led by the corrupt partisans of philip in either state to overlook without taking a single precaution against it the thing which was really dangerous to both peoples and needed their utmost watchfulness the unhindered growth of philip's power while, on the contrary, you were quite ready to entertain ill-feeling and to quarrel with one another. I kept unceasing watch to prevent this, nor did I rely only on my own judgment in thinking that this was what your interest required. I knew that Aristophan, and afterwards Eubulus, always wished to bring about this friendly union, and that, often as they opposed one another in other matters, they always agreed in this, 
cunning fox while they lived you hung about them and flattered them yet now that they are dead you do not see that you are attacking them for your censure of my policy in regard to thebes is far more denunciation of them than of me since they are before me in approving of that alliance but i return to my previous point that it was when aeschines had brought about the war at amphisa and the others his accomplices had effectually helped him to create the ill feeling against the thebans that philip marched against us for it was to render this possible that their attempt to throw the two cities into collision was made and had we not roused ourselves a little before it was too late we should never have been able to regain the lost ground to such a length had these men carried matters what the relations between the two peoples already were you will know when you have heard these decrees and replies demosthenes to the clerk take these and read them the decrees are read demosthenes to the clerk now read the replies the replies are read having established such relations between the cities through the agency of these men and being elated by these decrees and replies philip came with his army and seized elatea thinking that under no circumstances whatever should we and the thebans join in unison after this and though the commotion which followed in the city is known to you all let me relate to you briefly just the bare facts it was evening and one had come to the prytanes with the news that elatea had been taken upon this they rose up from supper without delay some of them drove the occupants out of the booths in the market-place and set fire to the wicker-work others sent for the generals and summoned the trumpeter and the city was full of commotion on the morrow at break of day the prytany summoned the council to the council chamber while you made your way to the assembly and before the council had transacted its business and passed its draft resolution the whole people was seated on the hillside and now when the council had arrived the Prytanes had reported the intelligence which they had received, and had brought forward the messenger, and he had made his statement. The herald proceeded to ask, Who wishes to speak? But no one came forward, and though the herald repeated the question many times, still no one rose, though all the generals were present, and all the orators, and the voice of their country was calling for some one to speak for her deliverance. For the voice of the herald, uttered in accordance with the laws, is rightly to be regarded as the common voice of our country and yet if it was for those to come forward who wished for the deliverance of the city all of you and all the other athenians would have risen and proceeded to the platform for i am certain that you all wished for her deliverance if it was for the wealthiest the three hundred would have risen and if it was for those who had both these qualifications loyalty to the city and wealth then those would have risen who subsequently made those large donations for it was loyalty and wealth that led them to do so but that crisis in that day called it seems not merely for a man of loyalty and wealth but for one who had also followed the course of events closely from the first and had come to a true conclusion as to the motive and the aim with which philip was acting as he was for no one who was unacquainted with these and had not scrutinized them from an early period was any the more likely for all his loyalty and wealth to know what should be done or to be able to advise you the man who was needed was found that day in me i came forward and addressed you in words which i ask you to listen to with attention for two reasons first because i would have you realize that i was the only orator or politician who did not desert his post as a loyal citizen in the hour of danger but was found there speaking and proposing what your need required in the midst of terror and secondly because by the expenditure of a small amount of time you will be far better qualified for the future in the whole art of political administration my words then were these quote, those who were unduly disturbed by the idea that philip can count upon the support of thebes do not i think understand the present situation for i am quite sure that if this were so we should have heard of his being not at elatea but on our own borders at the same time i understand quite well that he has come to prepare the way for himself at thebes listen i said while i tell you the true state of affairs philip already has at his disposal the thebans whom he could win over either by bribery or by deception and those who have resisted him from the front and are opposing him now he has no chance of winning what then is his design and object in seizing elatea he wishes by making a display of force in their neighbourhood and bringing up his army to encourage and embolden his own friends and to strike terror into his enemies that so they may either concede out of terror what they now refuse or may be compelled now i said if we make up our minds at the present moment to remember any ill-natured action which the thebans may have done us and to distrust them on the assumption that they are on the side of our enemies 
we shall be doing in the first place just what philip would pray for and further i am afraid that his present opponents may then welcome him that all may philippize with one consent and that he and they may march to attica together if however you follow my advice and give your minds to the problem before us instead of to the contentious criticism of anything that i may say i believe that i shall be able to win your approval for my proposals and to dispel the danger which threatens the city what then must you do you must first moderate your present alarm and then change your attitude and be alarmed all of you for the thebans they are far more within the reach of disaster than we it is they whom the danger threatens first secondly those who are of a military age with the cavalry must march to eleusis and let every one see that you yourselves are in arms in order that those who sympathize with you in thebes may be enabled to speak in defence of the right with the same freedom that their opponents enjoy when they see that just as those who are trying to sell their country to philip have a force ready to help them at Latia, so those who would struggle for freedom have you ready at hand to help them and to go to their aid if any one attacks them next i bid you elect ten envoys and give them full authority with the generals to decide the time of their own journey to thebes and to order the march of the troops but when the envoys arrive in thebes how do i advise that they should handle the matter i ask your special attention to this they must require nothing of the thebans to do so at such a moment would be shameful but they must undertake that we will go to their aid if they bid us do so on the ground that they are in extreme peril and that we foresee the future better than they in order that if they accept our offer and take our advice we may have secured our object and our action may wear an aspect worthy of this city or if after all we are unsuccessful the thebans may have themselves to blame for any mistakes which they now make while we shall have done nothing disgraceful or ignoble End quote. when i had spoken these words and others in the same strain i left the platform all joined in commending these proposals no one said a word in opposition and i did not speak thus and then fail to move a motion nor move a motion and then fail to serve as envoy nor serve as envoy and then fail to persuade the thebans i carried the matter through in person from beginning to end and gave myself up unreservedly to meet the dangers which encompassed the city demosthenes to the clerk bring me the resolution which was then passed but now Eskenes, how would you have me describe your part and how mine that day shall i call myself as you would call me by way of abuse and disparagement battleless and you no ordinary hero even but a real stage hero Crisphontes or creon or the character which you cruelly murdered at Calidus, enamous then i battleless of paeania prove myself of more value to my country in that crisis than onamous of cothacide in fact you were of no service on any occasion while i played the part which became a good citizen throughout demosthenes to the clerk read this decree the decree of demosthenes is read this was the first step towards our new relations with thebes and the beginning of a settlement up to this time the cities had been inveigled into mutual hostility hatred and mistrust by these men but this decree caused the peril that encompassed the city to pass away like a cloud it was for an honest citizen if he had any better plan than mine to make it public at the time instead of attacking me now the true counsellor and the dishonest accuser unlike as they are in everything differ most of all in this the one who declares his opinion before the event and freely surrenders himself as responsible to those who follow his advice to fortune to circumstances to any one the other is silent when he ought to speak and then carps at anything untoward that may happen that crisis as i have said was the opportunity for a man who cared for his country the opportunity for honest speaking but so much further than i need will i go that if any one who can now point to any better course or any course at all except that which i chose i admit my guilt if any one has discovered any course to-day which would have been our advantage had we followed it at the time i admit that it ought not to have escaped me but if there neither is nor was such a possibility if even now even to-day no one can mention any such course what was the counsellor of the people to do had he not to choose the best of the plans which suggested themselves and were feasible this i did for the herald asked the question Eskenes, who wishes to speak not who wishes to bring accusations about the past nor who wishes to guarantee the future and while you sat speechless in the assembly throughout that period i came forward and spoke 
Since, however, you did not do so then, at least inform us now, and tell us what words, which should have been upon my lips, were left unspoken. What precious opportunity offered to the city was left unused by me? What alliance was there, what course of action to which I ought, by preference, to have guided my countrymen? But with all mankind the past is always dismissed from consideration, and no one under any circumstances proposes to deliberate about it. It is the future or the present that make their call upon a statesman's duty. Now at that time the danger was partly in the future and partly already present, and instead of cavilling disingenuously at the results, consider the principle of my policy under such circumstances, for in everything the final issue falls out as heaven wills, but the principle which he follows itself reveals the mind of the statesman. Do not, therefore, count it a crime on my part that Philip proved victorious in battle. The issue of that event lay with God, not with me, but show me that I did not adopt every expedient that was possible, so far as human reason could calculate, that I did not carry out my plan honestly and diligently, with exertions greater than my strength could bear, or that the policy which I initiated was not honorable and worthy of Athens, and indeed necessary, and then denounce me, but not before. But if the thunderbolt or the storm which fell has proved too mighty not only for us, but for all the other Hellenes, what are we to do? It is as though a ship-owner who had done all that he could to ensure safety, and had equipped the ship with all that he thought would enable her to escape destruction, and had then met with a tempest in which the tackling had been strained, or even broken to pieces, were to be held responsible for the wreck of the vessel. Why, he would say, I was not steering the ship, just as I was not the general. I had no power over fortune, she had power over everything. But consider and observe this point. If it was fated that we should fare as we did, even when we had the Thebans to help us in the struggle, what must we have expected if we had not had even them for our allies, but they had joined Philip? And this was the object for which Philip employed every tone that he could command. And if, when the battle took place as it did, three days' march from Attica, the city was encompassed by such peril and terror, what should we have had to expect if this same disaster had occurred anywhere within the borders of our own country? Do you realize that, as it was, a single day and a second and a third gave us the power to rally, to collect our forces, to take a breath, to do much for the deliverance of the city, but that had it been otherwise? It is not well, however, to speak of things which we have not had to experience, thanks to the goodwill of one of the gods, and to the protection which the city obtained for herself in this alliance, which you denounce. The whole of this long argument, gentlemen of the jury, is addressed to yourselves and to the circle of listeners outside the bar, for to this despicable man it would have been enough to address a short, plain sentence. If to you alone, Eskenes, the future was clear, before it came, you should have given warning when the city was deliberating upon the subject, but if you had no such foreknowledge, you have the same ignorance to answer for as others. Why, then, should you make these charges against me, any more than I against you? For I have been a better citizen than you with regard to this very matter of which I am speaking. I am not as yet talking of anything else. Just in so far as I gave myself up to the policy which all thought expedient, neither shrinking from nor regarding any personal risk, while you neither offered any better proposals than mine, for then they would not have followed mine, nor yet made yourself useful in advancing mine in any way. What the most worthless of men, the bitterest enemy of the city, would do, you are found to have done, when all was over, and at the same time as the irreconcilable enemies of the city, Aristratus and Naxus, Aristolios and Thasos, are bringing the friends of Athens to trial Aeschines, in Athens itself, is accusing Demosthenes. But surely one who treasured up the misfortunes of the Hellenes, that he might win glory for them for himself, deserved to perish rather than to stand as the accuser of another, and one who is profited by the very same crisis as the enemies of the city cannot possibly be loyal to his country. You prove it, moreover, by the life you live, the actions you do, the measures you take, and the measures, too, that you do not take. Is anything being done which seems advantageous to the city? Aeschines is speechless. Has any obstruction, any untoward event occurred? There you find Aeschines, like a rupture or a sprain, which wakes into life so soon as any trouble overtakes the body. But since he bears so hardly upon the results, I desire to say what may even be a paradox, 
and let no one in the name of heaven be amazed at the length to which I go, but give a kindly consideration to what I say. Even if what was to come was plain to all beforehand, even if all foreknew it, even if you Iskines have been crying with a loud voice in warning and protestation, you who uttered not so much as a sound, even then, I say, it was not right for the city to abandon her course if she had any regard for her fame, or for our forefathers, or for the ages to come. As it is, she is thought, no doubt, to have failed to secure her object, as happens to all like, whenever God wills it. But then, by abandoning in favor of Philip her claim to take the lead of others, she must have incurred the blame of having betrayed them all. Had she surrendered without a struggle those claims in defense of which our forefathers faced every imaginable peril, who would not have cast scorn upon you, Iskines? Upon you, I say, not, I trust, upon Athens, nor upon me. In God's name, with what faces should we have looked upon those who came to visit the city if events had come round to the conclusion as they now have? If Philip had been chosen as commander and lord of all, and we had stood apart, while the others carried on the struggle to prevent these things, and that, although the city had never yet in time past preferred an inglorious security to the hazardous vindication of a noble cause, what Hellene, what foreigner, does not know that the Thebans and the Spartans, who were powerful still earlier, and the Persian king would all gratefully and gladly have allowed Athens to take what she liked and keep all that was her own, if she would do the bidding of another, and let another take the first place in Hellas. But this was not, it appears, the tradition of the Athenians. It was not tolerable. It was not in their nature. From the beginning of time, no one had ever yet succeeded in persuading the city to throw in her lot with those who were strong but unrighteous in their dealings, and to enjoy the security of servitude. Throughout all time, she has maintained her perilous struggle for preeminence, honor, and glory. And this policy you look upon as so lofty, so proper to your own national character, that of your forefathers also, it is those who have acted thus that you praise most highly, and naturally, for who would not admire the courage of those men who did not fear to leave their land and their city and to embark upon their ships, that they might not do the bidding of another? Who chose for their general Themistocles, who had counseled them thus, and stoned Circeus to death, when he gave his voice for submission to a master's orders, and not him alone, but for your wives stoned his wife also to death? For the Athenians of that day did not look for an orator or a general who would enable them to live in happy servitude. They cared not to live at all, unless they might live in freedom. For every one of them felt that he had come into being, not for his father and his mother alone, but also for his country. And wherein lies the difference? He who thinks he was born for his parents alone waits the death which destiny assigns him in the course of nature. But he who thinks he was born for his country also will be willing to die, that he may not see her in bondage, and will look upon the outrages and the indignities that he must needs bear in a city that is in bondage as more to be dreaded than death. Now were I attempting to argue that I induced you to show a spirit worthy of your forefathers, there is not a man who might not rebuke me with good reason. But in fact, I am declaring that such principles as these are your own. I am showing that before my time in the city displayed this spirit, though I claim that I, too, have had some share, as your servant, in carrying out your policy in detail. But in denouncing the policy as a whole, in bidding you be harsh with me, as one who has brought terrors and dangers upon the city, the prosecutor, in his eagerness to deprive me of my distinction at the present moment, is trying to rob you of praises that will last throughout all time. For if you condemn the defendant on the ground that my policy was not for the best, men will think that your own judgment has been wrong and that it was not through the unkindness of fortune that you suffered what befell you. But it cannot, it cannot be that you were wrong, men of Athens, when you took upon you the struggle for freedom and deliverance. No, by those who at Marathon bore the brunt of the peril, our forefathers. No, by those who at Platea drew up their battle line, by those at Salamis, by those who off Artemisium fought the fight at sea, by the many who lie in the sepulchres where the people laid them, brave men, all alike deemed worthy by their country, Iskines, of the same honor and the same obsequies, not the successful or the victorious alone, and she acted justly. For all these have done that which it was the duty of brave men to do, but their fortune has been that which heaven assigned to each. Accursed, pouring pedant, 
if you and your anxiety to deprive me of the honor and the kindness shown to me by my countrymen recounted trophies and battles and deeds of long ago and of which of them did this present trial demand the mention what spirit was i to take upon me when i mounted the platform i who came to advise the city how she would maintain her preeminence tell me third-rate actor the spirit of one who would propose things unworthy of this people i should indeed have deserved to die for you too men of athens are not to judge the private suits and public in the same spirit the business transactions of everyday life must be viewed in the light of the special law and practice associated with each but the public policy of statesmen must be judged by the principles that your forefathers set before them and if you believe that you should act worthily of them then whenever you come into court to try a public suit each of you must imagine that with his staff and his ticket there is entrusted to him also the spirit of his country but i have entered upon the subject of your forefathers achievements and have passed over certain decrees and transactions i desire therefore to return to the point from which i digressed when we came to thebes we found envoys there from philip and from the thessalians and his other allies our friends in terror is full of confidence and to show you that i am not saying this now to suit my own purpose read the letter which we your envoys dispatched without delay the prosecutor however has exercised the art of misrepresentation to so extravagant a degree that he attributes to circumstances not to me any satisfactory result that was achieved but for everything that fell out otherwise he lays the blame upon me and the fortune that attends me in his eyes apparently i the counsellor and orator have no share in the credit for what was accomplished as the result of oratory and debate while i must bear the blame alone for the misfortunes which we suffered in arms and as a result of generalship what more brutal what more damnable misrepresentation can be conceived demosthenes to the clerk read the letter the letter is read when they had convened the assembly they gave audience to the other side first on the ground that they occupied the position of allies and these came forward and delivered the harangues full of the praises of philip and of accusations against yourselves recalling everything that you had ever done in opposition to the thebans the sum of it all was that they required the thebans to show their gratitude for the benefits which they had received from philip and to exact the penalty for the injuries they had received from you in whichever way they preferred either by letting them march through their country against you or by joining them in the invasion of attica and they showed as they thought that the result of the course which they advised would be that the herds and slaves and other valuables of attica would find their way into boeotia while the result of what as they alleged you were about to propose would be that those of boeotia would be plundered in consequence of the war they said much more but all tending to the same effect as for our reply i would give my whole life to tell to you in detail but i fear lest now that those times have gone by you may feel as if a very deluge had overwhelmed all and may regard anything that is said on the subject as vanity and vexation but hear at least what we persuaded them to do and their answer to us demosthenes to the clerk take this and read it the answer of the thebans is read after this they invited and summoned you you marched you went to their aid and to pass over the events which intervened they received you in so friendly a spirit that while their infantry and cavalry were encamped outside the walls they welcomed your troops into the houses within the city among their children and wives and all that was most precious to them three eulogies did the thebans pronounce upon you before the world that day and those of the most honourable kind the first upon your courage the second upon your righteousness the third upon your self-control for when they chose to side with you in the struggle rather than against you they judged that your courage was greater and your requests more righteous than philip's and when they placed in your power what they and all men guard most jealously their children and wives they showed their confidence in your self-control in all these points men of athens your conduct proved that their judgment had been correct for the force came into the city but no one made a single complaint not even an unfounded complaint against you so virtuously did you conduct yourselves and twice you fought by their side in the earliest battles the battle by the river and the winter battle and showed yourselves not only irreproachable but even admirable in your discipline your equipment and your enthusiasm these things called forth expressions of thanks to you from other states and sacrifices and processions to the gods from yourselves 
and I should like to ask Eskenes whether, when all this was happening, and the city was full of pride and joy and thanksgiving, he joined in the sacrifices and the rejoicing of the multitude, or whether he sat at home, grieving and groaning and angry at the good fortune of his country. If he was present, and was seen in his place with the rest, surely his present action is atrocious, nay, even impious, when he asks you, who have taken an oath by the gods, to vote to-day that those very things were not excellent, of whose excellence he himself, on that day, made the gods his witnesses. If he was not present, then surely he deserves to die many times, for grieving at the sight of the things which he brought rejoicing to others. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read these decrees also. The decrees ordering sacrifices are read. Thus we were occupied at the time with sacrifices, while the Thebans were reflecting how they had been saved by our help and those who, in consequence of my opponents' proceedings, had expected that they would themselves stand in need of help, found themselves, after all, helping others, in consequence of the action that they took upon my advice. But what the tone of Philip's utterance was, and how greatly he was confounded by what had happened, you can learn from his letter, which he sent to the Peloponnese. Demosthenes to the clerk. Take these and read them. Demosthenes to the jury that you may know what was effected by my perseverance, by my travels, by the hardships I endured, by all those decrees of which Eskenes spoke so disparagingly just now. You have had, as you know, many great and famous orators, men of Athens, before my time, Callistratus himself, Aristophan, Cephalus, Thrasybulus, and a vast number of others. Yet not one of these ever gave himself up entirely to the state for any purpose. The mover of a decree would not serve as ambassador, the ambassador would not move the decree. Each left himself, at one and the same time, some respite from work, and some were to lay the blame in case of accidents. Well, someone may say, did you so excel them in force and boldness as to do everything yourself? I do not say that, but so strong was my conviction of the seriousness of the danger that had overtaken the city, that I felt I ought not to give my personal safety any place whatever in my thoughts. It was enough for a man to do his duty, and to leave nothing undone. And I was convinced with regard to myself, foolishly perhaps, but still convinced, that no mover would make a better proposal, no agent would execute it better, no ambassador would be more eager or more honest in his mission than I. For these reasons, I assigned every one of these offices to myself. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read Philip's letters. Philip's letters are read. To this condition, Eskenes, was Philip reduced by my statesmanship. This was the tone of his utterances, though before this he used to threaten the city with many a bold word. For this I was deservedly crowned by those here assembled, and though you were present, you offered no opposition. While Diondas, who indicted the proposer, did not obtain the necessary fraction of the votes. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read me these decrees. Demosthenes to the jury, which escaped condemnation and which Eskenes did not even indict. The decrees are read. These decrees, men of Athens, contain the very same syllables, the very same words, as those which Aristonicus previously employed in his proposal, and which Tesiphon, the defendant, has employed now. And Eskenes neither prosecuted the proposer of them himself, nor supported the person who indicted him. Yet surely, if the charges which he is bringing against me today are true, he would have had a better reason then for prosecuting Demomeles, the proposer of the decree, and Hyperides, than he has for prosecuting Tesiphon. And why? Because Tesiphon can refer you to them, to the decision of the courts, to the fact that Aeschines himself did not accuse them, though they had moved exactly what he has moved now, to the prohibition by law of further prosecution in such cases, and to many other facts, whereas then the case would have been tried on its merits before the defendant had got the advantage of any such precedent. But of course it was impossible then for Eskenes to act as he has acted now, to select out of many periods of time long past, and many decrees, matters which no one either knew or thought would be mentioned today, to misrepresent them, to change the dates, to put false reasons for the actions taken in place of the true, and so appear to have a case. At the time, this was impossible. Every word spoken then must have been spoken with the truth in view, at no distance of time from the events, while you still remembered all the facts and had them practically at your fingers' ends. For that reason, he evaded all investigation at the time, 
and he has come before you now in the belief i fancy that you will make this a contest of oratory instead of an inquiry into our political careers and that it is upon our eloquence not upon the interests of the city that you will decide end of section twenty eight recording by roger serling section twenty nine of the public orations of demosthenes this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D.J. Rose. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown, Part 5. Yes, and he ingeniously suggests that you ought to disregard the opinion which you had of each of us when you left your homes and came into court and that just as when you draw up an account in the belief that someone has a balance you nevertheless give way when you find that the counters all disappear and leave nothing over so now you should give your adhesion to the conclusion which emerges from the argument now observe how inherently rotten everything that springs from dishonesty seems to be by his very use of this ingenious illustration he has confessed that today at all events our respective characters are well established that i am known to speak for my country's good and he to speak for philip for unless that were your present conception of each of us he would not have sought to change your view and further i shall easily show you that it is not fair of him to ask you to alter this opinion not by the use of counters that is not how a political reckoning is made but by briefly recalling each point to you and treating you who hear me both as auditors of my account and witnesses to the facts. For that policy of mine, which he denounces, caused the Thebans, instead of joining Philip, as all expected them to do in the invasion of our country, to range themselves by our side and stay his progress. It caused the war to take place not in Attica, but on the confines of Boeotia, eighty miles from the city. Instead of our being harried and plundered by freebooters from Euboea, it gave peace to Attica from the side of the sea throughout the war. Instead of Philip's taking Byzantium and becoming master of the Hellespont, it caused the Byzantines to join us in the war against him. Can such achievements, think you, be reckoned up like counters? Are we to cancel them out, rather than provide that they shall be remembered for all time? I need not now add that it fell to others to taste the barbarity which is to be seen in every case in which Philip got any one finally into his power, while you reaped, and quite rightly, the fruits of the generosity which he feigned, while he was bringing within his grasp all that remained. But I pass this over. Nay, I will not even hesitate to say that one who wished to review an orator's career straightforwardly and without misrepresentation would not have included in his charges such matters as you just now spoke of, making up illustrations and mimicking words and gestures. Of course, the fortune which befell the Hellenes, surely you see this, was entirely due to my using this word instead of that, or waving my hand in one direction rather than the other. He would have inquired by reference to the actual facts, what resources and what forces the city had at her command when I entered political life, what I subsequently collected for her when I took control, and what was the condition of our adversaries. Then if I had diminished our forces, he would have proved that the fault lay at my door. But if I had greatly increased them, he would have abstained from deliberate misrepresentation. But since you have avoided such an inquiry, I will undertake it. And do you gentlemen observe whether my argument is just. The military resources of the city included the islanders, and not all, but only the weakest, for neither Chios nor Rhodes nor Corsera was with us. Their contribution in money came to forty-five talents, and these had been collected in advance. Infantry and cavalry, besides our own, we had none. But the circumstance, which was most alarming to us and most favorable to our enemies, was that these men had contrived that all our neighbors should be more inclined to enmity than to friendship, the Megarians, the Thebans, and the Eubians. Such was the position of the city at the time, and what I say admits of no contradiction. Now consider the position of Philip with whom our conflict lay. In the first place, he held absolute sway over his followers 
and this for the purposes of war is the greatest of all advantages. Next, his followers had their weapons in their hands always. Then he was well off for money, and did whatever he resolved to do without giving warning of it by decrees or debating about it in public, or being put on trial by dishonest accusers, or defending himself against indictments for illegality, or being bound to render an account to anyone. He was himself absolute master, commander, and lord of all. But I, who was set to oppose him, for this inquiry too it is just to make, what had I under my control? Nothing. For to begin with, the very right to address you, the only right I had, you extended to Philip's hirelings in the same measure as to me. And as often as they defeated me, and this frequently happened, whatever the reason on each occasion, so often you went away leaving a resolution recorded in favor of the enemy. But in spite of all these disadvantages, I won for you the alliance of the Eubians, Achaeans, Corinthians, Thebans, Megarians, Lucadians, and Corsarians, for whom there were collected, apart from their citizen troops, 15,000 mercenaries and 2,000 cavalry. And I instituted a money contribution on as large a scale as I could. But if you refer, Eschines, to what was fair as between ourselves and the Thebans, or the Byzantines, or the Eubians, if at this time you talk to us of equal shares, you must be ignorant in the first place of the fact that in former days also, out of those ships of war, three hundred in all, which fought for the Hellenes, Athens provided two hundred, and did not think herself unfairly used, or let herself be seen arraigning those who had counseled her action, or taking offense at the arrangement. It would have been shameful. No, men saw her rendering thanks to heaven, because when a common peril beset the Hellenes, she had provided double as much as all the rest to secure the deliverance of all. Moreover, it is but a hollow benefit that you are conferring upon your countrymen by your dishonest charges against me. Why do you tell them now what course they ought to have taken? Why did you not propose such a course at the time, for you were in Athens and were present? If it was possible in the midst of those critical times, when we had to accept not what we chose but what circumstances allowed, since there was one at hand bidding against us and ready to welcome those whom we rejected and to pay them into the bargain. But if I am accused today for what I have actually done, what if at the time I had haggled over these details and the other states had gone off and joined Philip and he had become master at once of Euboea and Thebes and Byzantium, what do you think these impious men would then have done? What would they have said? Would they not have declared that the states had been surrendered, that they had been driven away when they wished to be on your side? See, they would have said, would they not? He has obtained through the Byzantines the command of the Hellespont and the control of the corn trade of Hellas. And through the Thebans, a trying border war has been brought into Attica. And owing to the pirates who sail from Euboea, the sea has become unnavigable. And much more in addition. A villainous thing, men of Athens, is the dishonest accuser always. Villainous and in every way malignant and fault-finding. I and this miserable creature is a fox by nature that has never done anything honest or gentlemanly. A very tragical ape, a clod-hopping animus, a counterfeit orator. Where is the profit to your country from your cleverness? Do you instruct us now about things that are past? It is as though a doctor when he was paying his visits to the sick, were to give them no advice or instruction to enable them to become free from their illness. But when one of his patients died and the customary offerings were being paid him, were to explain, as he followed to the tomb, if this man had done such and such things, he would not have died. Crazy fool, do you tell us this now? Nor again will you find that the defeat, if you exult at it, when you ought to groan, accursed man, was determined by anything that was within my control. Consider the question thus. In no place to which I was sent by you as ambassador did I ever come away defeated by the ambassadors of Philip, not from Thessaly, nor from Ambracia, not from the Illyrians, nor from the Thracian princes, not from Byzantium, nor any other place, nor yet on the last occasion from Thebes. 
but every place in which his ambassadors were defeated in argument, he proceeded to attack and subdue by force of arms. Do you then require those places at my hands? Are you not ashamed to jeer at a man as a coward, and in the same breath to require him to prove superior by his own unaided efforts to the army of Philip, and that with no weapons to use but words? For what else was at my disposal? I could not control the spirit of each soldier, or the fortune of the combatants, or the generalship displayed, of which in your perversity you demand an account from me. No, but every investigation that can be made as regards those duties for which an orator should be held responsible, I bid you make. I crave no mercy. And what are those duties? To discern events in their beginnings, to foresee what is coming, and to forewarn others. These things I have done. Again, it is his duty to reduce to the smallest possible compass, wherever he finds them, the slowness, the hesitation, the ignorance, the contentiousness, which are the errors inseparably connected with the constitution of all city-states, while on the other hand he must stimulate men to unity, friendship, and eagerness to perform their duty. All these things I have done, and no one can discover any dereliction of duty on my part at any time. If one were to ask any person whatever by what means Philip had accomplished the majority of his successes, every one would reply that it was by means of his army, and by giving presents and corrupting those in charge of affairs. Now I had no control or command of the forces. Neither then does the responsibility for anything that was done in that sphere concern me. And further, in the matter of being or not being corrupted by bribes, I have defeated Philip. For just as the bidder has conquered one who accepts his money, if he effects his purchase, so one who refuses to accept it and is not corrupted has conquered the bidder. In all, therefore, in which I am concerned, the city has suffered no defeat. The justification, then, with which I furnished the defendant for such a motion as he proposed with regard to me, consisted, along with many other points, of the facts which I have described and others like them. I will now proceed to that justification which all of you supplied. For immediately after the battle, the people, who knew and had seen all that I did, and now stood in the very midst of the peril and terror, at a moment when it would not have been surprising if the majority had shown some harshness toward me, the people, I say, in the first place carried my proposals for ensuring the safety of the city, and all the measures undertaken for its protection, the disposition of the garrisons, the entrenchments, the funds for the fortifications, were all provided for by decrees which I proposed. And in the second place, when the people chose a corn commissioner out of all Athens, they elected me. Subsequently, all those who were interested in injuring me combined and assailed me with indictments, prosecutions after audit, impeachments, and all such proceedings, not in their own names at first, but through the agency of men behind whom they thought they would best be screened against recognition. For you doubtless know and remember that during the early part of that period I was brought to trial every day, and neither the desperation of Sosicles, nor the dishonest misrepresentations of Philocrates, nor the frenzy of Diondus and Melantus, nor any other expedient was left untried by them against me. And in all these trials, thanks to the gods above all, but secondarily to you and the rest of the Athenians, I was acquitted, and justly. For such a decision is in accordance both with truth and with the credit of jurors who have taken their oath and given a verdict in conformity with it. So whenever I was impeached, and you absolved me, and did not give the prosecutor the necessary fraction of the votes, you were voting that my policy was the best. Whenever I was acquitted upon an indictment, it was a proof that my motion and proposals were according to law. Whenever you set your seal to my accounts at an audit, you confessed in addition that I had acted throughout with uprightness and integrity. And this being so, what epithet was it fitting or just that Tessaphon should apply to my actions? Was it not that which he saw applied by the people and by juries on their oath? and ratified by truth in the judgment of all men? Yes, he replies, but Cephalus' boast was a noble one, that he had never been indicted at all. True, and a happy thing also it was for him. 
But why should one who has often been tried, but has never been convicted of crime, deserve to incur criticism any the more on that account? Yet in truth, men of Athens, so far as Escanes is concerned, I too can make this noble boast that Cephalus made. For he has never yet preferred or prosecuted any indictment against me. So that by you, at least, Escanes, I am admitted to be no worse a citizen than Cephalus. His want of feeling and his malignity may be seen in many ways, and not least in the remarks which he made about fortune. For my part, I think that as a rule, when one human being reproaches another with his fortune, he is a fool. For when he who thinks himself most prosperous and fancies his fortune most excellent, does not know whether it will remain so until the evening, how can it be right to speak of one's fortune, or to taunt another with his? But since Escanes adopts a tone of lofty superiority upon this as upon many other subjects, observe, men of Athens, how much more truthful and more becoming in a human being my own remarks upon Escanes' fortune will be. I believe that the fortune of this city is good, and I see that the god of Dodona also declares this to you through his oracle. But I think that the prevailing fortune of mankind as a whole today is grievous and terrible. For what man, Hellene or foreigner, has not tasted abundance of evil at this present time? Now the fact that we chose the noblest course, and that we are actually better off than those Hellenes who expected to live in prosperity if they sacrificed us, I ascribe to the good fortune of the city. But in so far as we failed, in so far as everything did not fall out in accordance with our wishes, I consider that the city has received the share which was due to us of the fortune of mankind in general. But my personal fortune, and that of every individual among us, ought, I think, in fairness, to be examined with reference to our personal circumstances. That is my judgment with regard to fortune. And I believe, as I think you also do, that my judgment is correct and just. But Escanes asserts that my personal fortune has more influence than the fortune of the city as a community, the insignificant and evil more than the good and important. How can this be? If, however, you determine at all costs to scrutinize my fortune, Escanes, then compare it with your own. And if you find that mine is better than yours, then cease to revile it. Examine it then from the very beginning. And in heaven's name, let no one condemn me for any want of good taste. For I neither regard one who speaks insultingly of poverty, nor one who prides himself on having been brought up in affluence as a man of sense. But the slanders and misrepresentations of this unfeeling man oblige me to enter upon a discussion of this sort, and I will conduct it with as much moderation as the facts allow. I then, Ascanese, had the advantage as a boy of attending the schools which became my position and of possessing as much as one who is to do nothing ignoble owing to poverty must possess. When I passed out of my boyhood, my life corresponded with my upbringing. I provided choruses and equipped warships. I paid the war tax. I neglected none of the paths to distinction in private or public life, but gave my services both to my country and my friends. And when I thought fit to enter public life, the measures which I decided to adopt were of such a character that I have been crowned many times, both by my country and by many other Hellenic peoples, while not even you, my enemies, attempt to say that my choice was not at least an honorable one. Such is the fortune which has accompanied my life. And though I might say much more about it, I refrain from doing so, in my anxiety not to annoy anyone by the expression of my pride. And you, the lofty personage, the despiser of others, what has been your fortune when compared with this? The fortune, thanks to which you were brought up as a boy in the depths of indigence, in close attendance upon the school along with your father, pounding up the ink, sponging down the forms, sweeping the attendance rooms, occupying the position of a menial, not of a free-born boy. Then, when you became a man, you used to read out the books to your mother at her initiations, and help her in the rest of the hocus-pocus by night dressing the initiated in fawn skins, drenching them from the bowl, purifying them and wiping them down with the clay and the bran, and, when they were purified, bidding them stand up and say, The ill is done, the good begun. Priding yourself upon raising the shout of joy more loudly than anyone had ever done before, and I can believe it, for when his voice is so loud you dare not imagine that his shout is anything but superlatively fine. But by day you used to lead those noble companies through the streets, 
men crowned with fennel and white poplar, throttling the puff adders and waving them over your head, crying out, Evo, Sabo, and dancing to the tune of Hyas Attis, Attis Hyas, addressed by the old hags as leader, captain, ivy bearer, fan bearer, and so on. And as the reward of your services getting sops and twists and barley bannocks, who would not congratulate himself with good reason on such things, and bless his own fortune? But when you were enrolled among your fellow parishioners, by whatever means, for of that I say nothing, when I say you were enrolled, you at once selected the noblest of occupations, that of a clerk and servant to petty magistrates. And when at length you escaped from this condition also, after yourself doing all that you impute to others, you in no way, heaven knows, disgraced your previous record by the life which you subsequently lived. For you hired yourself out to the actors Similis and Socrates, the Roarers they were nicknamed, and played as a third-rate actor, collecting figs and bunches of grapes and olives, like a fruiterer gathering from other people's farms, and getting more out of this than out of the dramatic competitions in which you were competing for your lives. For there was war without truce or herald between yourselves and the spectators and the many wounds you received from them make it natural for you to jeer at the cowardice of those who have had no such experiences. But I will pass over all that might be accounted for by your poverty, and proceed to my charges against your character itself. For you chose a line of political action, when at length it occurred to you to take up politics too, in pursuance of which, when your country's fortune was good, you lived the life of a hare, in fear and trembling, always expecting a thrashing for the crimes which lay on your conscience. Whereas all have seen your boldness amid the misfortunes of others. But when a man plucks up courage at the death of a thousand of his fellow citizens, what does he deserve to suffer at the hands of the living? I have much more to say about him, but I will leave it unsaid. It is not for me, I think, to mention lightly all the infamy and disgrace which I could prove to be connected with him, but only so much as it is not discreditable to myself to speak of. And now review the history of your life and of mine, side by side, good-temperedly, Eskenes, not unkindly. And then ask these gentlemen which fortune of the two each of them would choose. You taught letters. I attended school. You conducted initiations. I was initiated. You were a clerk. I a member of the assembly. You a third-rate actor. I a spectator of the play. You used to be driven from the stage while I hissed. Your political life has all been lived for the good of our enemies, mine for the good of my country. To pass over all besides, even on this very day, I am being examined with regard to my qualification for a crown. It is already admitted that I am clear of all crimes, while you have already the reputation of a dishonest informer. And for you the issue at stake is whether you are to continue such practices or to be stopped once and for all through failing to obtain a fifth part of the votes. A good fortune indeed, can you not see, is that which has accompanied your life, that you should denounce mine. And now let me read to you the evidence of the public burdens which I have undertaken, and side by side with them do you, Eskenes, read the speeches which you use to murder. I leave the abysm of death and gates of gloom, and know that I am not fain ill news to bring, and evil in evil wise. May you be brought to perdition by the gods above all, and then by all those here present villainous citizen, villainous third-rate actor that you are. To the clerk, read the evidence. The evidence is read. Such was I in my relation to the state, and as to my private life, unless you all know that I was open-hearted and generous and at the disposal of all who had need of me, I am silent. I prefer to tell you nothing, and to produce no evidence whatever, to show whether I ransomed some from the enemy, or helped others to give their daughters in marriage, or rendered any such services. For my principle may perhaps be expressed thus, I think that one who has received a kindness ought to remember it all his life, but that the doer of the kindness should forget it once for all. If the former is to behave like a good man, the latter like a free one from all meanness. To be always recalling and speaking of one's own benefactions is almost like upbraiding the recipients of them. 
I will do nothing of the kind, and will not be led into doing so. Whatever be the opinion that has been formed of me in these respects, with that I am content. But I desire to be rid of personal topics, and to say a little more to you about public affairs. For if, Eschines, you can mention all of those who dwell beneath the sun above us, Hellene or foreigner, who has not suffered under the absolute sway, first of Philip and now of Alexander, so be it. I concede that it is my fortune or misfortune, whichever you are pleased to call it, that has been to blame for everything. But if many of those who have never once even seen me or heard my voice have suffered much and terribly, and not individuals alone, but whole cities and nations. How much more just and truthful is it to regard the common fortune as it seems to be of all mankind, and a certain stubborn drift of events in the wrong direction as the cause of these sufferings. Such considerations, however, you discard. You impute the blame to me whose political life has been lived among my own fellow countrymen, and that, though you know that your slander falls in part, if not entirely, upon all of them, and above all upon yourself. For if, when I took part in the discussion of public affairs, I had absolute power, it would have been possible for all of you, the other orators, to lay the blame on me. But if you were present at every meeting of the assembly, if the city always brought forward questions of policy for public consideration, if at the time my policy appeared the best to everyone, and above all to you, for it was certainly from no good will that you relinquished to me the hopes, the admiration, the honors, which all attracted themselves to my policy at the time, but obviously because the truth was too strong for you, and you had nothing better to propose, then surely you are guilty of monstrous iniquity in finding fault today with a policy than which at the time you could propose nothing better. Among all the rest of mankind, I observe that some such principles as the following have been, as it were, determined and ordained. If a man commits a deliberate crime, indignation and punishment are ordained against him. If he commits an involuntary mistake instead of punishment, he is to receive pardon. If, without crime or mistake, one who has given himself up wholly to that which seems to be for the advantage of all, has, in company with all, failed to achieve success, then it is just not to reproach or revile such a man, but to sympathize with him. Moreover, it will be seen that all these principles are not so ordained in the laws alone. Nature herself has laid them down in her unwritten law and in the moral consciousness of mankind. Eschines, then, has so far surpassed all mankind in brutality and in the art of misrepresentation that he actually denounces me for things which he himself mentioned under the name of misfortunes. End of section 29。section 30 of the public orations of Demosthenes。this is a LibriVox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryce, Youngstown. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Crown, Part 6. In addition to everything else, as though he had himself always spoken straightforwardly and in loyalty, he bade you keep your eyes on me carefully and make sure that I did not mislead or deceive you. He called me a clever speaker, a wizard, a sophist, and so on, just as if it followed that when a man had the first word and attributed his own qualities to another, the truth was really as he stated, and his hearers would not inquire further who he himself was that said such things. But I am sure that you all know this man, and are aware that these qualities belong to him far more than to me. And again, I am quite sure that my cleverness, yes, let the word pass, though I observe that the influence of a speaker depends for the most part on his audience, for in proportion to the welcome and good will which you accord to each speaker is the credit which he obtains for wisdom. I am sure, I say, that if I too possess any such skill, you will find it constantly fighting on your behalf in affairs of state, 
never in opposition to you, never for private ends, while the skill of Ascanes, on the contrary, is employed not only in upholding the cause of the enemy, but in attacking any one who has annoyed him or come into collision with him anywhere. He neither employs it uprightly nor to promote the interests of the city. For a good and honorable citizen ought not to require from a jury who have come into court to represent the interests of the community that they shall give their sanction to his anger or his enmity or any other such passion, nor ought he to come before you to gratify such feelings. It were best that he had no such passions in his nature at all, but if they are really inevitable, then he should keep them tame and subdued. Under what circumstances, then, should a politician and an orator show passion? When any of the vital interests of his country are at stake, when it is with the enemies that the people has to deal, those are the circumstances. For then is the opportunity of a loyal and gallant citizen. But that when he has never to this day demanded my punishment, either in the name of the city or in his own, for any public, nor, I will add, for any private, crime, he should have come here with a trumped-up charge against the grant of a crown and a vote of thanks, and should have spent so many words upon it. That is a sign of personal enmity and jealousy and meanness, not of any good quality, and that he should further have discarded every form of lawsuit against myself, and should have come here today to attack the defendant, is the very extremity of baseness. It shows, I think, Ascanese, that your motive in undertaking this suit was your desire not to extract vengeance for any crime, but to give a display of rhetoric and elocution. Yet it is not his language, Ascanese, that deserves our esteem in an orator, nor the pitch of his voice, but his choice of the aims which the people chooses, his hatred or love of those whom his country loves or hates. He whose heart is so disposed will always speak with loyal intent, but he who serves those from whom the city foresees danger to herself does not ride at the same anchor as the people, and therefore does not look for safety to the same quarter. But I do, mark you, for I have made the interests of my countrymen my own, and have counted nothing as reserved for my own private advantage. What? You have not done so either? How can that be, when immediately after the battle you went your way as an ambassador to Philip, the author of the calamities which befell your country at that time, and that, despite the fact that until then you always denied this intimacy with him, as every one knows? But what is meant by a deceiver of the city? Is it now one who does not say what he thinks? Upon whom does the herald justly pronounce the curse? Is it not upon such a man as this? With what greater crime can one charge a man who is an order than that of saying one thing and thinking another? Such a man you have been found to be. And after this, do you open your mouth or dare to look this audience in the face? Do you imagine that they do not know who you are? Or that the slumber of forgetfulness has taken such a hold upon them all that they do not remember the speeches which you used to deliver during the war? when you declared with imprecations and oaths that you had nothing to do with Philip, and that I was bringing this accusation against you, when it was not true, to satisfy my personal enmity? But so soon as the news of the battle had come, you thought no more of all this, but at once avowed and professed that you stood on a footing of friendship and guest friendship with him, though these were nothing but your hireling service under other names, for upon what honest or equal basis could Escanes, the son of Glaucothea, the tambourine player, enjoy the guest friendship, or the friendship, or the acquaintance of Philip? I cannot see. In fact, you had been hired by him to ruin the interests of these your countrymen. And yet, though your own treason has been so plainly detected, though you have been an informer against yourself after the event, you still revile me, and reproach me with crimes of which, you will find, any one is more guilty than I. Many a great and noble enterprise, Ascanese, did this city undertake and succeed in, inspired by me, and she did not forget them. It is a proof of this that when, immediately after the event, the people had to elect one who should pronounce the oration over the dead, and you were nominated, 
They did not elect you for all your fine voice, nor Demades, who had just negotiated the peace, nor Hegemon, nor any other member of your party, they elected me. And when you and Pythocles came forward in a brutal and shameless fashion, God knows, and made the same charges against me as you are making again today, and abused me, the people elected me even more decidedly. And the reason you know well, but I will tell you nevertheless, they knew for themselves both the loyalty and zeal which inspired my conduct of affairs and the inequity of yourself and your friends. For what you denied with oaths when our cause was prosperous, you admitted in the hour of the city's failure, and those accordingly you were only enabled by the misfortunes of their country to express their views without fear. They decided to have been enemies of their own for a long while, though only then did they stand revealed. And further, they thought that one who was to pronounce an oration over the dead and to adorn their valor should not have come beneath the same roof, nor shared the same libation as those who were arrayed against them, that he should not there join with those who with their own hands had slain them, in the revel and the triumph song over the calamities of the Hellenes, and then come home and receive honor, that he should not play the mourner over their fate with his voice, but should grieve for them in his heart. What they required they saw in themselves and in me, but not in you, and this was why they appointed me and not any of you. Nor when the people acted thus did the fathers and brothers of the slain, who were then publicly appointed to conduct the funeral, act otherwise. For since, in accordance with the ordinary custom, they had to hold the funeral feast in the house of the nearest of kin, as it were, to the slain, they held it at my house, and with reason. For though by birth each was more nearly akin to his dead than I, yet none stood nearer to them all in common. For he who has had their life and their success most at heart had also, when they had suffered what I would they had not, the greatest share of sorrow for them all. To the clerk, read him the epitaph which the city resolved to inscribe above them at the public cost to Ascanese, that even by these very lines, Ascanese, you may know that you are a man destitute of feeling, a dishonest accuser, an abominable wretch. The inscription, These for their country, fighting side by side, by deeds of arms, dispelled the foeman's pride. Ere lives they saved not, bidding death made clear, impartial judge, their courage or their fear. For Greece they fought, lest neath the yoke brought low, in Thaldrin she the suppressor's scorn should know. Now in the bosom of their fatherland, after they toil they rest, tis God's command. Tis God's alone, from failure free to live, escape from fate to no man doth he give. Do you hear, Ascanese, in these very lines? Tis God's alone, from failure free to live. Not to the statesman has he ascribed the power to secure success for those who strive, but to the gods. Why then, accursed man, do you revile me for our failure in words which I pray the gods to turn upon the heads of you and yours? But even after all the other lying accusations which he has brought against me, the thing which amazed me most of all, men of Athens, was that when he mentioned what had befallen the city, he did not think of it as a loyal and upright citizen would have thought. He shed no tears, he felt no emotion of sorrow in his heart. He lifted up his voice, he exalted, he strained his throat, evidently in the belief that he was accusing me, though in truth he was giving us an illustration, to his own discredit, of the other difference between his feelings and those of others, at the painful events which had taken place. But surely one who professes, as Ascanese professes now, to care for the laws and the Constitution, ought to show, if nothing else, at least that he feels the same griefs and the same joys as the people, and has not, by his political profession, ranged himself on the side of their opponents. That you have done the latter is manifest today, when you pretend that the blame for everything is mine, and that it is through me that the city was plunged in trouble. 
though it was not through my statesmanship or my policy, gentlemen, that you began to help the Hellenes, for were you to grant me this, that it was through me that you had resisted the dominion which was being established over the Hellenes. You would have granted me a testimonial which all those that you have given to others together could not equal. But neither would I make such an assertion, for it would be unjust to you, nor, I am sure, would you concede its truth. And if Ascanese were acting honestly, he would not have been trying to deface and misrepresent the greatest of your glories in order to satisfy his hatred towards me. But why do I rebuke him for this when he has made other lying charges against me, which are more outrageous by far? For when a man charges me, I call heaven and earth to witness, with philippizing, what will he not say? By Heracles and all the gods, if one had to inquire truthfully, setting aside all calumny and all expression of animosity, who are in reality the men upon whose heads all would naturally and justly lay the blame for what has taken place, you would find that it was those in each city who resemble Ascanese, not those who resemble me. For they, when Philip's power was weak and quite insignificant, when we repeatedly warned and exhorted you and showed you what was best, they, to satisfy their own avarice, sacrificed the interests of the community, each group deceiving and corrupting their own fellow citizens, until they brought them into bondage. Thus the Thessalians were treated by Deocus, Cineus, and Thrasydeus, the Arcadians by Circidus, Hieronymus, and Eucampidus, the Argives by Myrtus, Teledamus, and Manassius, the Eleans by Euxithius, Cleotimus, and Aristachmus, the Mycenaeans by the sons of the godforsaken Philiatus, Neon and Thrasylochus, the Sycamians by the Aristratus and the Epicaries, the Corinthians by Dionarchus and Demaritus, the Megarians by Petoidorus, Helixus and Perillus, the Thebans by Timolus, Theogeton, and Anemotus, the Euboeans by Hipparchus and Sosotratus. Daylight will fail me before the list of the traitors is complete. All these men of Athens are men who pursue the same designs in their own cities as my opponents pursue among you, abominable men, flatterers, evil spirits, who have hacked the limbs each of his own fatherland, and like boon companions have pledged away their freedom, first to Philip and now to Alexander, men whose measure of happiness is their belly and their lowest instincts, while as for freedom and the refusal to acknowledge any man as lord, the standard and rule of good to the Hellenes of old, they have flung it to the ground. Of this shameful and notorious conspiracy and wickedness, or rather, to speak with all earnestness, men of Athens, of this treason against the freedom of the Hellenes, Athens has been guiltless in the eyes of all men, in consequence of my statementship, as I have been guiltless in your eyes. And do you then ask me for what merits I count myself worthy to receive honor? I tell you that at a time when every politician in Hellas has been corrupted, beginning with yourself, firstly by Philip and now by Alexander, no opportunity that offered, no generous language, no grand promises, no hopes, no fears, nor any other motive, tempted or induced me to betray one jot of what I believe to be the rights and interests of the city, nor of all the counsel that I have given to my fellow countrymen up to this day, has any ever been given, as it has by you, with the scales of the mind inclining to the side of gain, but all out of an upright, honest, uncorrupted soul. I have taken the lead in greater affairs than any man of my own time, and my administration has been sound and honest throughout all. That is why I count myself worthy of honor. But as for the fortifications and entrenchments for which you ridiculed me, I judge them to be deserving, indeed, of gratitude and commendation. Assuredly they are so, but I set them far below my own political services. Not with stones, nor with bricks, did I fortify this city. Not such are the works upon which I pride myself most. 
but would you inquire honestly wherein my fortifications consist? You will find them in munitions of war, in cities, in countries, in harbors, in ships, in horses, and in men ready to defend my fellow countrymen. These are the defenses I have set to protect Attica, so far as by human calculation it could be done, and with these I have fortified our whole territory, not the circuit of the Piraeus or of the city alone. Nor, in fact, did I prove inferior to Philip in calculations, far from it, or in preparations for war, but the generals of the Confederacy and their forces proved inferior to him in fortune. Where are the proofs of these things? They are clear and manifest. I bid you consider them. What was the duty of a loyal citizen, one who was acting with all forethought and zeal and uprightness for his country's good? Was it not to make Euboea the bulwark of Attica on the side of the sea, and Boatea on that of the mainland, and on that of the regions towards the Peloponnese, our neighbors in that direction? Was it not to provide for the corn trade, and to ensure that it should pass along a continuously friendly coast all the way to the Piraeus? Was it not to preserve the places which were ours, Proconnesius, the Chersonese, to Nados, by dispatching expeditions to aid them and proposing and moving resolutions accordingly, and to secure the friendship and alliance of the rest, Byzantium, Tenedos, Euboea? Was it not to take away the greatest of the resources which the enemy possessed, and to add what was lacking to those of the city? All this has been accomplished by my decrees and by the measures which I have taken, and all these measures, men of Athens, will be found by any one who will examine them without jealousy to have been correctly planned and executed with entire honesty. The opportunity for each step was not, you will find, neglected or left unrecognized or thrown away by me, and nothing was left undone, which it was within the power and the reasoning capacity of a single man to effect. But if the might of some divine power, or the inferiority of our generals, or the wickedness of those who were betraying your cities, or all those things together continuously injured our whole cause until they effected its overthrow, how is Demosthenes at fault? Had there been in each of the cities of Hellas one man, such as I was, as I stood at my own post in your midst, nay, if all Thessaly and all Arcadia, had each but one man animated by the same spirit as myself, not one Hellenic people, either beyond or on this side of Thermophile, would have experienced the evils which they now suffer. All would have been dwelling in liberty and independence, free from all fears, secure and prosperous, each in their own land, rendering thanks for all those great blessings to you and the rest of the Athenian people through me. But that you may know that in my anxiety to avoid jealousy, I am using language which is far from adequate to the actual facts, to the clerk, read me this, and take and recite the list of the expeditions sent out in accordance with my decrees. The list of expeditions is read. These measures, and others like them, Askenes, were the measures with which it was the duty of a loyal and gallant citizen to take. If they were successful, it was certain that we should be indisputably the strongest power, and that with justice as well as in fact, and now that they have resulted otherwise, we are left with at least an honorable name. No man casts reproach either upon the city or upon the choice which she made. They do but upbraid fortune, who deciding the issue thus. It was not, God knows, a citizen's duty to abandon his country's interests, to sell his services to her opponents, and cherish the opportunities of the enemy instead of those of his country. Nor was it, on the other hand, to show his malice against the man who had faced the task of proposing and moving measures worthy of the city, and persisting in that intention, while, on the other hand, he remembered and kept his eyes fixed upon any private annoyance which another had caused him, nor was it to maintain a wicked, and festering inactivity, as you so often do. Assuredly, there is an inactivity that is honest and brings good to the state. The inactivity which you, the majority of the citizens, observe in all sincerity. But that is not the inactivity of Ascanese. Far from it. 
He, on the contrary, retires just when he chooses from public life, and he often chooses to do so, that he may watch for the moment when you will be sated with the continual speeches of the same adviser, or when fortune has thrown some obstacle in your path, or some other disagreeable event has happened, for in the life of man many things are possible, and then when such an opportunity comes, suddenly, like a gale of wind, out of his retirement he comes forth an orator, with his voice and training, and his phrases and his sentences collected, and these he strings together lucidly, without pausing for breath, though they bring with them no profit, no accession of anything good, but only calamity to one or another of his fellow citizens, and shame to all alike. Surely, Askenes, if all this practice and study sprang from an honest heart, resolved to pursue the interests of your country, the fruits of it should have been noble and honorable and profitable to all. Alliances of cities, supplies of funds, opening of ports, enactment of beneficial laws, acts of opposition to our proved enemies. It was for all such services that men looked in bygone days, and the past has offered, to any loyal and gallant citizen, abundant opportunities of displaying them. But nowhere in the ranks of such men will you ever be found to have stood, not first, nor second, nor third, nor fourth, nor fifth, nor sixth, nor in any position whatsoever, at least not in any matters whereby your country stood to gain. For what alliance has the city gained by negotiations of yours? What assistance, what fresh access of goodwill or fame? What diplomatic or administrative action of yours has brought new dignity to the city? What department of our home affairs or our relations with Hellenic and foreign states over which you have presided has shown any improvement? Where are your ships? Where are your munitions of war? Where are your dockyards? Where are the walls that you have repaired? Where are your cavalry? Where in the world is your sphere of usefulness? What pecuniary assistance have you ever given as a good and generous fellow citizen, either to rich or poor? But, my good sir, you say, if I had done none of these things, I have at least given my loyalty and good will. Where? When? Why, even at a time when all who ever opened their lips upon the platform contributed voluntarily to save the city, till, last of all, Aristonicus gave what he had collected to enable him to regain his civil rights, even then, most inquitous of men, you never came forward or made any contribution whatever, and assuredly it was not from poverty, when you had inherited more than five talents out of the estate of your father-in-law, Philo, and had received two talents subscribed by the leaders of the naval boards for your damaging attack upon my naval law. But I will say no more about this, lest by passing from subject to subject I should break away from the matter at hand. It is at least plain that your failure to contribute was not due to your poverty, but to your anxiety to do nothing in opposition to those whose interest is a guide of your whole public life. On what occasions, then, do your spirit and your brilliancy show themselves? When something must be done to injure your fellow countrymen, then your voice is most glorious, your memory most perfect, then you are a prince of actors, a theocrines on the tragic stage. Again you have recalled the gallant men of old, and you do well to do so. Yet it is not just, men of Athens, to take advantage of the good feeling which you may be relied upon to entertain towards the dead, in order to examine me before you by their standard, and compare me, who am still living amongst you, with them. Who in all the world does not know that against the living there is always more or less of secret jealousy, while none, not even their enemies, hate the dead any more? And am I, in spite of this law of nature, to be judged and examined today by the standard of those who were before me? By no means. It would be neither just nor fair. Askenes. But let me be compared with yourself, or with any of those who have adopted the same policy as yourself, and are still alive. And consider this also, which of these alternatives is the more honorable, which is better for the city? that the good service is done by men of former times, tremendous, nay, even beyond all description, though they may be, 
should be made an excuse for exposing to ingratitude and contumely those that are rendered to the present generation, or that all who act in loyalty should have a share in the honors and the kindness which our fellow citizens dispense. A. And, if I must say this after all, the policy and the principles which I have adopted will be found, if rightly viewed, to resemble and to have the same aims as those of the men who in that age received praise, while yours resemble those of the dishonest assailants of such persons in those days. For in their time also there were obviously persons who disparaged the living and praised the men of old, acting in the same malicious way as yourself. Do you say then that I am no way like them? But are you like them, Ascanese, or your brother, or any other orator of the present day? For my part, I should say none, nay, my good sir, to use no other epithet, compare the living with the living, their contemporaries, as men do in every other matter, whether they are comparing poets or choruses or competitors in the games. Because Philemon was not so powerful as Glaucus of Charistus and some other athletes of former times, he did not leave Olympia uncrowned. But because he fought better than all who entered against him, he was crowned and proclaimed victor. Do you likewise examine me beside the orators of the day? Beside yourself, beside anyone in the world that you choose. I fear no man's rivalry. For while this city is still free to choose the best course, and all alike could compete with one another in loyalty to their country, I was found the best adviser of them all. It was by my laws, by my decrees, by my diplomacy that all was effected. Not one of your party appeared anywhere, unless some insult was to be offered to your fellow countrymen. But when there happened, what I would had never happened, when it was not statesmen that were called to the front, but those who would do the bidding of a master, those who were anxious to earn wages by injuring their country and to flatter a stranger, that along with every member of your party you were found at your post, the grand and resplendent owner of a stud, while I was weak, I confess, yet more loyal to my fellow countrymen than you. Two characteristics, men of Athens, a citizen of a respectable character, for this is perhaps the least invidious phrase that I can apply to myself, must be able to show when he enjoys authority, he must maintain to the end the policy whose aims are noble action and the preeminence of his country, and at all times and in every phase of fortune he must remain loyal. For this depends upon his own nature, while his power and his influence are determined by external causes. And in me, you will find, this loyalty has persisted on the Lloyd. For mark this, not when my surrender was demanded, not when I was called to account before the Amphictyans, not in face either of threats or of promises, not when these accursed men were hounded on against me like wild beasts, have I ever been false to my loyalty towards you. For the very first, I chose the straight and honest path in public life. I chose to foster the honor, the supremacy, the good name of my country, to seek to enhance them or to stand and fall with them. I do not walk through the market, cheerful and exultant, over the success of strangers, holding out my hand and giving the good tidings to any whom I expect to report my conduct yonder, but shuddering, groaning, bowing myself to the earth, when I hear of the city's good fortune, as do these impious men, who make a mock of the city, not remembering that in doing so they are mocking themselves, while they direct their gaze abroad, and, whenever another has gained success through the failure of the Hellenes, belaud the state of things, and declare that we must see that it endures for all time. Never, O oh, all ye gods, may any of you consent to their desire. If it can be, may you implant even in these men a better mind and heart. But if they are verily beyond all cure, then bring them and them alone to utter an early destruction by land and sea. And to us who remain, grant the speediest release from the fears that hang over us, and safety that naught can shake. End of section 30, end of On the Crown, end of the public orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard Cambridge.
Recording by Bryce, Youngstown.